Okay then guys, welcome to the very, very first uh, Blimey It's Only, and I'm delighted to see I have got the ever-wonderful uh, Mr. Paul E. Moz, a good friend, writer, um, video gamer, and general all-nice chap. Firstly, Paul, welcome. Thanks very much. You'll see anything to get people on here, won't you? <laughs> ever-wonderful, that's a good description. <laughs> you only see what I've got for Dominic Diamond, bloody hell. <laughs> But uh, firstly, Paul, thank you for being uh, my guinea pig for this, yeah. uh, what I'm hoping to be a new feature. Now, I don't mind admitting, guys, anybody that watches my channel probably realises uh, I made a complete and utter balls at last week. Paul and I spent about was it two and a half hours, Yeah, I think it was, um, recording this, and it turned out to be a complete and utter mess. The interview went great, but uh, it was my uh, technical wizardry that let us down badly. So hopefully... Yeah, you blame yourself, I'll go with that. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully this one is going to be a wee bit better anyway, so again, thanks for joining me, Paul. So, right, just to kick off, Paul, uh, you obviously know the questions, so you know what, when not to talk about other things, because you know what's going to come in anyway, but uh, just tell tell the viewers a little bit about yourself. What is Who is Paul E. Moz? Who is Paul E. Moz? <sighs> well, uh, Paul E. Moz is a gamer, I suppose. I've been playing games since the 70s. Uh, I used to love playing in the arcades and in the chip shops and on caravan sites or holidays and what have you. used to love all the arcade games. Um, my dad used to bring home stuff like TV games with the old Pong games on them and stuff that really were awful, but you didn't know any better at the time, so it was fantastic mm -hmm. then. Um, so I suppose from the days of Galaxian and whatnot, that was like when I really knew I loved video games. Right, you're getting into question number three. Already. I was meaning you meant to say I'm uh, Polly Moz from, from Newcastle. I'm married to two kids. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll go back and go. I'm Polly Moz. I'm from <laughs> County Durham, and I'm married with two kids. County Durham. So if I told, if I said Newcastle and you're a Geordie, would you take offence to that? Absolutely not. Yeah, you know, I thought you were going to say absolutely. I've right. worked in Newcastle for most of my life, so yeah. I'm kind of, you know, mostly Geordie anyway. But uh, don't Good. say the other word. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm not going to that one. Good no, stuff. I right, I apologise for looking down, guys, but I've not got this uh, off by heart. Right, what was your first gaming memory? Um, <clears throat> it's hard to say. I think probably the one I can remember best I used to go to a caravan park in a place called Amble on the Northumbrian coast. Oh, I, Ambleside, is that, is that the same place? Just, just um, I, I don't know if it's near or not, actually. I'm not very good with geography, strangely enough. Uh, <laughs> I don't know anywhere where I'm, I'm at or anything, but I do remember Amble well. Uh, had an RAF base nearby, and used to get the, see all the planes flying around and stuff. But this caravan park had a sort of a fairground with a little arcade in. Excuse uh, me a little second, Paul. That is the phone, as, as oh, all good things oh. work. Just bear me off a second. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, that's uh, called the telephone. <laughs> Beg your pardon. Sorry, Paul, right, you were discussing uh, your very first gaming memory in Amble, I think. Yes, now that that phone's on silent, so we'll not be interrupted again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I used to go to the arcade with my dad, and um, the most vivid memory is of playing this old game. It was called Dive Bomber. In our, it was an arcade game, but it wasn't... Was that, know, an, was that not an old porn film I saw back in the 80s? <laughs> I remember that was a different one. <laughs> hey, whatever you get up to in your own time is entirely up to you. <laughs> Sorry, uh, mate. <laughs> no, it was a game where you had a plane, I think it was on kind of a wire or something, and it used to dive down, and you had a joystick to steer, and there was these tanks going along the bottom, so you had to steer the plane towards the tanks and try and <laughs> shoot them as your plane was swooping down. It was good. It was, it was on a wire. <laughs> yeah, mechanical. A mechanical video game. It was a game. mechanical machine. It was... Um, <laughs> But it was really good. You got like 10 or 12 swoops of your plane or something to try and get as many points as you could. Um, and it was really good. Uh, so that's probably the first... Was it all was it all encased in a sort of like a glass case so you couldn't touch it or something? It looked, it, it looked like an arcade it? machine, yeah. It looked Aye. like an arcade machine, but it had a lot more depth, obviously, because your plane actually went swooping in. <laughs> um, so a, bit, really good. a bit like, what was the name of that game? Uh, what the hell was it called? Air Deck? Flight Deck? Flight oh, Deck. Oh. Do you remember Flight Deck? No. By no, Airfix so Models. It was basically exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. And you had, it was just like a, a, a pulley system. You had one wheel there, one wheel there, and it had like a, a thread that went round it. Right. And you, you actually had this little plane. It was a, a jump jet harrier. And yeah. you guided this joystick. And obviously, as you pushed the joystick forwards, 
the wire would dip, which made the plane fly down, and you have to kind of fly and land in this thing. It sounds very similar, actually. A little bit, yeah. It had lots of big flashy explosions and things, but uh, that was really good. And then there was all, all, obviously all the classic arcade games like Galaxian and mm-hmm. Gold Space and well. So I've been been playing games since then. For a long, long time then. Yeah. Well, oh, sorry, only a long time. I, I put one too many longs in there. <laughs> You're not that old. <laughs> Almost as long as they've been around, I suppose. So, yeah, you know, it's a long, long time. <laughs> Suddenly I feel old. <laughs> Good stuff. Right. When did you realise this video game thing was here to stay? Um, at the point probably when all your other other mates had buggered off and they are looking for to pull girls, you were still sitting at home <laughs> playing, waggling your joystick and whatnot. I always had one mate, actually, who was much like me, I suppose. So I always had a kindred spirit. Um, but I suppose... It was a step up to 16 bits, really. Uh, there was only, I suppose, two of us that really were still in the games then. Everybody else was doing other stuff, and I'd go down to his and play on his Amiga and whatnot, you know. So, um, yeah, I suppose when the 16 bits came into force, it's probably the back end of the 80s when that happened for me. So, did you have a, an ST or a, an Amiga? I didn't have either. Oh, you didn't just use your, your mate's one. I, I, I. All my 16-bit needs, I had the Commodore 64. I'd got a cheap disk drive by then, so I was getting all the old disk games, like the RPGs and stuff. Um, so I kind of skipped out on the 16-bit computers, and then we got a, I think a Mega Drive was the next time we got a, a new game system in. So, But, uh, yeah, that would be the, the point for me, I think, everyone else. So did you, when you had your, your first computer, was, I'm right in thinking, was a, a C64? Yeah. Was it? Uh, um I've been, loads of other people had, I'd seen people with the ZX81 and Spectrums of various kinds and I'd, I'd mm. go to their house and I was always interested in them, um, but the Commodore 64 was the first one I actually got. Right, and then so, I mean, you, you had that up to, did, did you have a point where you stopped playing video games and then you got a 16-bit, or you didn't get a 16-bit, sorry, you, you, did, was there a break between you playing the C64 and then get playing with your mate's Amiga, or was it just kind of a continual yeah, was, right through? Was, was kind of the same same sort of time so mm-hmm. ah right right i mean the, the commodore 64 that was, those games came out for it right into the 90s so that's true uh, right, yeah. so i did keep playing that at the same time but i suppose i i was losing a little bit of interest i suppose by then but then the mega drive came out and i really like resurrected that. your interest uh. and then i just went on to the other consoles after that so yeah never looked never <laughs> looked back exactly <laughs> Brilliant, right, let's see, um, <clears throat> you and I go way back to, is it 1999, something like that, 2000? About, about then, yeah. Ouch, uh, I believe in Yak Yak, um, what, how did you first, can you get, now for anybody that's uh, watching this that doesn't know Yak Yak, Yak Yak is basically, it's a, a forum of sorts um, that was kind of created around Lamasoft, Jeff Minter, uh, the, the hairy beast programmer who's got a, a thing for, for animals. Um, we'll say no more about it. Um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, it's that's that's where I first got involved in the whole retro scene, and obviously you discovered other people that had the same interest. So, how did you first kind of get get to know about Yak Yak? What were you googling? Uh, <laughs> Funny uh, animals. <laughs> <laughs> no, strangely <laughs> enough, um, it was, I never even connected that much with Lamas off back in the day. I just knew that a llama on the front of the. I didn't. I didn't realise the programmer was actually kept all these animals and stuff uh. <laughs> was, was really across my mind um i suppose really it was it was at the same sort of time i was just sort of googling commodore 64 was it google back then i don't even remember it was yahoo words. i think it was um, it be yahoo anyway, back in the day. I, I was doing searches for commodore 64 on my pc for some reason or other um and i found at the same time the lemon 64 website and forum which i was mm. very excited by because Good you website. Could download and play Commodore 64 games on your expensive PC. It was, like, it was a revolution. <laughs> I've spent hundreds and hundreds on this PC and I can play a Mastertronic budget game. <laughs> <on it. laughs> full speed, though. <laughs> oh, yeah, full speed. Uh, and I think it must have been from there where I ended up getting across to Yak Yak and... Um, and I suppose the rest is history from that. No, and then it also went from, it went from uh, Yak Yak and then, uh, I think if my memory serves me correctly, Mark Racing of Retrovision fame and uh, Richard Coworld, they came up with uh, Way of the Rodent for them, and then that was an offshoot. In fact, I think I mean it, obviously Way of the Rodent was initially it was it was an online mag, um, which was kind of supported by Yak Yak. I think it might have even been hosted in the Yak Yak forums. 
I think. Been, well, originally, I mean, that's where yeah. everybody that wrote for Way of the Road came from, isn't it? Aye, that's right, yeah. Because I think Richard Mark had had a, some some sort of little magazine of them set themselves going like a physical one years and years that's back. right I think it was was you know did they not win a competition in computer video games I think right. to come yeah. up with a fanzine I've always looked for I've got all the all the, the PDFs for uh, yeah. computer video games but I've never managed to find it but yeah, yeah. So this, and obviously they decided to, to resurrect it I think it went better than they ever could have imagined oh I, I think that was really good where they got everybody from wasn't it all the writers mm -hmm, tended to mm -hmm. from there originally so do you still was, go to yak yak yeah, yeah. Still you, I, I, I mean, I, I can look upon it as like a shop that's kind of run down. It's nobody really goes there anymore. You, yeah, I pop in and have a know. look. Uh, I tried to resurrect the uh, Llamasoft League. Oh, aye, aye. League, League with two L's. League. Yeah, League. It's uh, very <laughs> Welsh. Um, but I can't do Excel and the program that. that <laughs> I was just given a program said if you put these scores in and do this it'll it'll extract the table but uh, it doesn't work on Windows <laughs> Seven so I'm knackered there. So, Aye, uh, so yeah. Yeah, I still keep in touch with all those old places. It's still, they're still about. Aye, excellent. Uh, where I should actually mark these off as I'm getting to them right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm just not very well organised. Uh, right, you've always enjoyed writing about this hobby. Um, when did you first discover you enjoyed writing about games? When when did that sort of start, mm -hmm. the, the writing aspect of, of it? <laughs> when, well, I suppose, it, when was it resurrected or when did it really, really start? Ah, when did you sort of get a, a thing for writing about games? Originally, I guess like most people or a lot of people... I used to read Zap 64 and have me Commodore 64, and I really wanted to be a reviewer. I would love to have been a reviewer for Zap 64, to the point where I actually applied for a job with them at one point. I don't know if I was 17 or something. <laughs> uh, obviously turned down, rightfully so. But what I used to do was um, I couldn't program computers at all. I never could, never, never will, ever. It's not something that I really have the capacity for. But... I could do things with sort of print and go-to statements. So when I had my Commodore 64 and all my collection of games, what I did was I did a little program where it arranged them all in the, the genres and, of game. Uh, mm -hmm. And you could choose which one by selecting one, two, three, four, five, six, whatever. And then it would go into the list of all those kinds of games I owned. And it would list them all with a number. And then you could choose that number and it would take you to the review. And I'd written a review on there. <laughs> Brilliant to tell you what the games were and giving it a little rate and everything. So I obviously liked it from an early age. Um, I remember in English, English Lit, I think it was, I reviewed Lord of the Flies with a Zap 64 style review. <laughs> where I gave it a ratings box at the end and everything. Complete with thumbs up or was it a thumbs down? <laughs> no, I got a thumbs up. Uh, I think I gave it 84% or something. Uh, and my English teacher marked it and said, nice Zap style review. So <laughs> they were always Zap fans yeah. as well then. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, really right from uh, there. It was back in the mid two thousands with the way the Roden thing that really took off again. That's when yeah, yeah. But you've always you've always enjoyed the, the written word. Yeah. About yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. <coughs> Excuse me. Um yeah, okay. Zap issue one hundred and seven, I believe. Um that was what was that what was it called? It was the <laughs> it was the unofficial uh, next magazine, wasn't it? It was, um there's a guy called Cameron Davis, who's in Australia actually, and he kept going on about, um, oh, it'd be great if there's a Zap 107, because the last one, number 106, uh, pe people felt it wasn't a good end, I suppose. So he kept saying, yeah, hey, we should bring it back, and um, there was actually quite a lot of interest, uh, including from some ex-Zappers as well. So, yeah, well, there was, there was Gordon Houghton, Paul Glancy, yep. Robin Hogg, Paul Sumner. Yeah. Yep. Paul Sumner, yeah, and Paul Sumner. Oh, was that that <laughs> fictitious person? <laughs> yeah, he was involved. Um, no, yeah, that was it. Was really it was it was amazing how it came together and how everyone put all this work into to get this professional looking magazine up and running. It's an it. It excellent. Just, I was actually looking at it earlier on. It's actually a really, it's a really, really good edition, isn't it? It's really good. Aye. I mean, obviously it's shorter because there weren't as many games, but it looks like a zap and it actually feels like a zap when you read it as well. And since I'd always wanted to be a Zap reviewer, then that was it was like a dream come true, I suppose. <laughs> and who did the, the, the famous uh, thumbs up thing off you then? Oh, there's a guy called Ant Stiller. Uh, he's in Australia as well. Uh, and he did that, and I, I, I still use those pictures, actually. I, I'm quite pleased with them. Um, they're, not, they're not a bad second to Oliver Frey's stuff at all, are they? Did he, I think he didn't do the original. Did Oliver Frey do the original ones? Yeah, Oliver Frey did them. And... Aye, aye. 
he's still he's still doing stuff. He's got a website with yeah, all this yeah. stuff. But um, yeah, it was a really right. good thing. And then so when, when when was that the Zap One Hundred Seven? When did that happen? Was Ooh, that the early noughties, Was it? It was um, about about two thousand and four ish, I mm-hmm. think. Um, because there was a follow up, which was just called a Deaf Guide to Zap, and it was sort of like the Zap backs that they used to do. Was that the one that was in Retro Gamer? That's the exact one, yeah. Ah, right, right, right. It's not planned, but I think yeah. uh, it got picked up on because they realised that the first job was a good one, so I think they, they muscled in and said, yeah, we'll have some of that. Mm. Uh, not sure whether they were approached by the the team behind um, the Deaf Guide to Zap or whether it was the other way around. But anyway, whatever happened, it ended up in there, and that was, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that's not bad. I mean, there must be quite a few thousand people who read that. So, aye, aye. Do you, yeah. do you, do you read uh, Retro Gamer? I do. do you, I wouldn't do say I buy it religiously or anything. I oh, you like, don't? Ah, oh, right. That's interesting. What, what do you think? What do you think of it? Oh, I like it. Yeah, it's pretty good. Um, I mean, it just depends what's in. Sometimes there's a lot more that I'm interested in than others. Aye. Uh, I suppose <laughs> it's good to read all the different articles anyway. If there's something you you didn't really know much about, that's it's good to catch up on. But some things grab your interest a, a lot more. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've I was a subscriber from issue two. I think it was. I got issue one. I happened to stumble across it and. Was it W. H. Smith? I think it was, and then I subscribed from issues too. So I've got them all. Um, I mean, they're all dog-eared and all that. I like to do like reading <laughs> in the bath, so you know they, they get all they get all worn yeah. inside and all that. And um, but I mean, I've got every single collection, every single one. I mean, I think we're up to about 160 or something. And I keep I keep wishing they would hurry up and just stop it, so I can then <laughs> punt them on and sell them. You know, full collection. Um, and I, I'm a bit like yourself. I mean, I get I do get it. Every, in fact, there's one sitting at my doorstep there just now, which I'm not even bored to pick up. I think I've got about maybe 10 that I haven't read. I find there's less and less and less content in them that I'm actually reading now. Um, it's for them it's, to do, isn't it? I mean, they've covered so much now. What can they pick up on that's still interesting to people? There's always aye, something, aye. but it, it it just depends on uh, very I mean, much what's in it, isn't it? Really, it is. Uh, they still have some good stuff. It's hard to fill a whole magazine, but I can see them reaching two hundred. No bother. Aye. Anyway. I mean, somebody made a comment. I think it was on my YouTube channel, um, saying, "Oh, they're, they're they're doing well. Most magazines don't last that long, but I think most magazines are based on a current console. So when the console stops." Been yeah, uh, yeah. commercially available, the magazine stops. It stops, but because they are covering systems that are dormant anyway, in theory they could go on forever. Exactly. Yeah. You and know, and whether that's a good thing or not, I'm not too sure. I don't know. I mean, they're, they're talking about expanding it the the next generation from what they're, they're covering now, and I don't know if it's what are they talking about PS2 and Xbox possibly. They, no, that'll, that'll probably be that, when I stop but, subscribing. I think. <laughs> to be honest with you. I mean, obviously, you give them a lot more to write about. Is it retro enough? I don't know. If mm-hmm, enough, is mm-hmm. it? But, uh, I mean, they talk about the Dreamcast as well. And the Dreamcast came out 16 years ago. That's, that's you know. But <laughs> yeah. it's... In fact, well, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, I'm on a, a Facebook page. It's retro for sale. Um, it's excellent oh, yeah. if you want to buy and sell stuff without the fee, the, the exorbitant eBay fees. Um, and somebody, somebody went on to... The, there's rules, and it, one of the rules is uh, it must be retro. You know, mm. or else you can get banned. Bit yeah. extreme, but anyway. Uh, and somebody went on, believe it or not, and offered a PSP for sale. <laughs> Shock horror! <What>? And flame, <laughs> they flamed away. Get them off, burn the heretic. Um, and then that got the question: What is is a PSP retro? What is what is retro? What what would you define as as retro? It's a tough one, isn't it? I mean, you could argue that anything that they don't still make and sell games for is is retro, I suppose. But is it? I mean. It's, uh, it's there's a sort of classic era, but as you get older, I suppose newer newer consoles or will fall into that. Um, I just tend to look back on the particular era I'm more interested in. I mean, yeah. I suppose the I suppose the PS One's retro. I suppose the the I mean the Sega Saturn and all those are, they are I suppose retro. But I don't know if I would actually go to the point of writing about them. At this yeah. Time. It's funny how I mean I've discussed this before. Discuss, discussion is when there's somebody else talking to you. I've I've spoken to a camera about this before. Um, what is retro? Um, and I think it, retro will depend on what age you are. Now, yeah. you know, given that I was playing games from 1983, I can still remember looking at um, what was the magazine Mean Machines. 
mm-hmm. uh, Julian Rignall wrote for it, yep. Mean Machines, and it was the Sega Mega Drive, and it was all these Japanese games, and I just thought this was like the dog's bollocks, this was like this unaffordable next generation machine. And then I remember going into a, a game shop in Edinburgh, and they were playing Sonic the Hedgehog, and it was like an import. And I, I back then, I looked upon that as the next generation, and I still look upon that as as kind of not retro, you know, the Mega Drive, and the PlayStation to me is like next gen, you know, and the PlayStation I'll, 2 I'll, is just next gen as well. But <laughs> I would definitely go retro with the Mega Drive, I think. But oh, yeah, yeah. I think there but... has to be a long enough time period between when... I think it has to be something that you played when you were young enough to be nostalgic about to it have when the connection, time has passed. So Aye. you don't start playing something until you're in your 30s. It's not going to be retro to you until thirty years down the line, really. Aye, is it? that's right. Like, that's true. That's, that's true. What it is. It's funny how I'm kind of getting completely off topic here, but I always think these make for interesting things anyway. Um, I mean, you, you you mentioned there a system is only going to be you've only got like the nostalgia for a system that you owned, a system that you never actually had. You've got no connection with. I mean, yeah. I, I'll I'll fire up um, my, my Commodore sixty four and play Bruce Lee. I mean, you actually look at the game, it's as basic as you as you could ever get. If yeah. somebody wrote a game on the PC now and released it in its, in its present form, i.e. you're looking like Bruce Lee, I wouldn't want to play it. i go, it's crap, <laughs> look at it, shit. You know, it's jerky <laughs> movement, it's got crap sound. But because it's because it's something that I did as a kid, then you've got the connection to it. Yeah, there's, there's a big part of it, isn't it? It's, um, that all factors in, definitely. Aye, yeah. I know, so... Anyway, Paul, we better crack on because our yeah. time is wearing on. Okay, Paul, right, the uh, next one. I was uh, doing a wee Google um, to see if I could find, dig up anything from you. Uh, retroactive reviews. What have you got to oh. say about that? <laughs> tell tell the viewers what that was, retroactive reviews. That. No, that was <laughs> fun, actually. Uh, for some reason, I kind of... I wanted to do the writing thing, and I was wanting to do my own website. And it wasn't quite as easy then it is as it is now. You had to sort of do some sort of rudimentary code. So I, I was I was learning basic HTML stuff and I thought I'll I'll do a reviews website. And I thought I'll review some games and I thought, hang on a minute, I'll do it like the Zap team and I'll get some people in and uh, and they can be my reviewers as well and I'll have the, the three reviewer heads and so on and so forth. Uh so it kind of snowballed quite quickly, I suppose. There was a lot of people quite interested in doing it. Because I got involved, I think you advertised for reviewers on Zap. Was it Zap? It Zap yeah, and Yak Yak, yak and I there. came on board. Um, yeah. Yeah, I went on Atari Age and I went on World of Spectrum and I got this complete gang of reprobates and misfits. And Ah, there were certainly a, a gang <laughs> of misfits. I was trying to portray myself as the next uh, Stuart Campbell. Um, I probably didn't quite pull it off, other than we're both quite ugly, but uh, apart from that... There'll we'll never be a next Stuart Campbell. <laughs> is there any room for another Stuart Campbell? <laughs> I think, I think the world would end if that happened. He's unique. <laughs> talk, actually, talk, just mentioning Stuart Campbell. Who would, if, if you don't have anything, tell me, have you got a favourite games writer? And you can't say yourself. Um, I, I, it's, I'm going to go with the with the Zap lads, to be honest, because it was just so much... Especially the earlier editions, up to about the first fifty or so, the they were just such a a good laugh, you know. I mean, they were fanboys, eh? I mean, it was it was real gamers writing about games. eh? They were were just people who played games, who went in and played games, and then wrote what they thought about them. And it seemed like they could say what they liked, or and they They didn't care, did they? I mean, they they never they were never influenced by advertising or anything like that. They just they didn't get that impression. I mean, later on, people said, "Oh, thalamus, blah blah," and what Mm. have you. But you know, if they thought a game was worth three percent, then they'd give it three percent. You know, Uh, it was it was excellent, and and some of the comments were absolutely fantastic. (laughs) And I still read them and have a laugh now. So, I mean, I I I guess everybody that read the magazine had sort of one they liked most. I, I. I suppose I probably like Julian Rignall the most out of the Zap lads, but the three originals, if you like, I mean, there was him and Gary Penn and Gary Lydon, although he came in a bit later, but those three together was just a tremendous team. Yeah. Uh, and you really just, they were like the cool kids and you just wanted to go and... and you wanted to be like them, I remember yeah. meeting them at a, a computer show down in London, you know, and it was... Yeah. This was before the internet and that kind of thing, but yeah, yeah. 
I would I'd probably go with Stuart Campbell. I think uh, I mean a fellow Scot. I just I've always loved his style. I mean he, he doesn't make he makes enemies probably more than he makes friends. But I've <laughs> always I've always I mean and it's the same with the Zap guys. It has to be said, you know that was the Bible when you got your when I got my my twelve pound fifty wages um, from Wilco on a Saturday, <laughs> I would race up in my moped up to the computer shop before it shut like half an hour later, and I always had the Zap magazine, and that was what right I'm going to get beachhead or I'm going to get exploding fists. I knew what game I was buying. Yeah, and the you know, and they were always bang on. They were never wrong. It wasn't just the ratings. You tended to identify with one of them and what he said about the game. You might think, right, I'll probably like that then. Uh, Aye. It, was, it wasn't quite the same with other magazines. Even when they used initials to say who might have written about it, you still weren't quite sure who it was. Who it was, but yeah. Having the face on there and something to identify with, it was, it was a great way of doing it. I think if I remember rightly, it was Gary Payne, though, he was the... The other two would say, oh, this is brilliant, he goes, this is shit. <laughs> <laughs> he was always a wee bit left-field kind of thing. But I think they had different personalities. I think, I think Julian Rignall was quite... Yeah, he was more enthusiastic. Gary Penn was a bit more... Sort he was of, a shooter's uh, up expert, wasn't he? He was a shmups. And uh, yeah, and Gary, yeah. Gary didn't used to come out with some crazy stuff at, t- at times as well. His his Nexus review will live long in the memory. <laughs> if, you that. If, if you can't remember it, go and look it up on online. Gary Lydon's Nexus review. Yeah, I'll need just, that's a that's a question for him. I'll need because I've got him hopefully coming on next week or not next yeah. week. This is going to be a monthly thing, um, given the logistics to actually pull this thing together, as you can probably appreciate. So <laughs> I, I think one a, a month. Question, um, I put a question for him on there, which is one I would ask him myself if I oh. get the chance. Which is, what was your favourite use of the Nexus box? And when <laughs> you get that review, you'll see what I mean. <laughs> I'll ask him. <laughs> Superb, good stuff. Right, okay, retroactive reviews. Uh, when did you first get the idea to write a book? When did you actually commit to yourself, right, I'm going to do this? When I was it? I had idea about the same time as I was finding all the Commodore 64 stuff, so back about 2001, and the title I'm using, that They Were Our Gods, I thought about it even back then, it just popped into my head as something that would really fit well. But in terms of committing to actually do it, I sort of let it slip for a long time. Uh, did you? Didn't think about it. I was writing things for the way of the road, and I had my own blog and so on. So I was doing that, and really it was when From Bedrooms to Billions came out, or when not when it came out, but when they announced it. Uh, I saw they were on Indiegogo, and then they went on Kickstarter, and I read what they were doing, and I thought, oh crap, that's basically what my book was going to be. <laughs> I thought I've got this, take your thunder, aye. Yeah, it ruins everything. Um, and then I thought, ah, you know what? It doesn't have to. I think I'll do it anyway. So that's when I said, right. I'm definitely going to do this. And as it happens from Bedrooms to Billions, doesn't really impact on what I've done anyway. It's got all these people talking about the games industry, but I'm not talking to the people about the games industry. I'm talking about them to them about the actual games or the, whatever the work was that they did, whether they were an artist or a musician or whatever. So I'm talking about the actual work, uh, which is quite unique at the minute, I think. Uh, mm-hmm. Although I'm sure, sure I'll have that idea stolen by people who have more time for these things now mm-hmm. that I've said it. <laughs> Hopefully, the fact they're not commit to video, they're going to run away and write their own, <laughs> their own book. <laughs> they were our, they were our heroes. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. <just> <laughs> um, so it's been, it's been nearly three years, I suppose. Three years in the making, yeah. Just about. Wow. Well, <laughs> you know that. I'm sure. I. <laughs> I've, I've been Christmas. gutted every Christmas. Absolutely <laughs> gutted every Christmas, mate. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, they were our gods. Can you explain the title? What, what, where did you, what made you come up with that title? What does it mean? It's just that for us kids as teenagers or whatever, sitting in our room playing our games, people, they had people who like pop stars and they had posters of pop stars on the walls and you had people who like films and movies and had posters of, I don't know, Tom Cruise or whatever or the Rat Pack or whatever on the, what was the Brat Pack? Anyhow, anyone our age had the Rat Pack on the walls, you'd think they were weird. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Well, people had movie stars on the walls, and we used to take out posters of video game adverts and things and put them on our walls. So all the people that made these games, that was like our equivalent of the rock stars and, and the film stars. So if you want to use a word, gods for your favourite... You, yeah, you know, yeah. That's where it came from, the, the games programmers and the people that did all the stuff that basically took up all of our time outside school, they were our gods, so it just seemed like a logical title to me. Aye. No, I mean, I can always remember, um, I can always remember going to uh, 
the, it was a retro vision back in 2005, I think it was, 2004 or three. Mm. I can't remember exactly. And uh, I knew that Jeff Minter was going to be along and uh, I'd never met Jeff before and I was, you know, playing some video game and the door opened and then he came, you know, re- resplendent, uh, big furry <laughs> jacket thing. And I thought, fucking hell, he's a bit taller than I imagine it would be as well. Uh-huh. And uh, it was quite surreal, but then I was up at the bar and before I knew it, there was Jeff standing to my left and I says, oh, how you doing, Jeff? I say, hey, Meister. Yeah, how you doing, man? He's quite quite soft-spoken. He's very, he's quite um, placid. And uh, how you doing, man? I says, aye, oh, good tie. And I says, how's Unity? This was a game that uh, was oh, yeah, being written Cube. for the GameCube. I think yeah. it was, uh, we'll, not, we'll not mention uh, Peter, what, what's his name? The poor guy. What's his name? Peter, oh, no, Molyneux. Peter Molyneux, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I forgot about that. It was going to be... It was a Lionhead. Yeah. It was Lionhead Studios. Oh, was it, was it not Bullfrog or Lion? I can't remember. It might have been like it was Lionhead, actually. Lionhead, wasn't it? Yeah. But uh, I said to Jeff, how's, how's Unity coming on? He's, oh, wait, wait, I'll show you this, man. And he dug in and he's uh, sort of man bag and brought out this little portable sort of video player thing, DVD. And he put this disc in. He pressed play and there was uh, this, the visuals of Unity. And he's sort of getting like that and he's sort of dancing away watching this thing. And I'm <laughs> sitting watching it as well. I'm going... This is fucking surreal. This Jeff, Jeff, fucking man, Jeff. That's Jeff Minter, and he's showing me Alan Stewart his new game. I'm like, <laughs> consider my mind, my socks blowing off, you know. But yeah, it's it's a it's a completely bizarre thing. But yeah, good stuff, Paul. Yeah. yeah anyway, let's see. The light's getting bad. You're gonna read that. What does that say? Light or your eyes? Which one? Oh, you? probably a bit of both, mate. <laughs> if I'm honest. Um, what did we see here? Yeah, how do you think, in fact, you know, you've already, you've actually touched on that already, I was going to say, how do you think your book is going to differ from what is already out there? I mean, I know, uh, I'm not going to plug them at all, but I know there's a, a certain person that's written a couple of books, um, sort of gaming type books, and yeah. um, you, yours is going to be more about the man and the game, and what yeah, prompted the game, what was the... different it? perspective to everything else, it's, I mean, I've, I'm, I'll talk, uh, whoever I talk to, I'll talk about how they got started and so on, and what, what in how they got into computer games or whatever it is that they happen to do, and then any games that they actually wrote for the eight bits, I'll I'll ask them a few questions about it, and and then when I write my bit, I'll write something about it. I'll have some screenshots, and then I'll put their actual from the horse's mouth insights in there as well. So it's just I just think it's it's a different perspective, and I think it's going to be really interesting. For I think people. yeah, I'm sure. I mean, some people have seen a couple of the pages I've done so far, just as little. Yeah, they are, I'm very impressed. I like even it's, the typeset you've used as well. The the thing that tends to come out is people just say they just want to read some more straight away. Aye, so aye. I'm on to a winner with that. That's got to be absolutely encouraging. Aye, definitely good stuff. Um, have you got a kind of set? When I mean, when you know you're, who you're going to be interviewing, have you got a set a sort of set template of questions, or does it vary from person to person? I've got some because the opening and closing questions, I suppose, can be more or less the same. The the sort of where did you grow up and uh, how did you get into computer games and how did you get into program and all that. But just asking about specific games, you've got to actually come up with individual questions for all them. You can't really use the same questions. So, you know, I'm, I'll play all the games again and uh, make some notes and take some videos and this, that and the other. And it's quite a, a long process and actually thinking of interesting questions, you know, it's just half a dozen per game, which tends to be about the average. It's quite hard sometimes, mm-hmm. especially if you've got, say, eight games to ask about. Aye, aye. Like half a dozen questions that aren't the same as the questions about the last aye, game. Aye, aye, yeah, trying to keep it's, a bit of variety. It's, it's quite difficult, so uh, that's one of the reasons it takes as long to do, you know. You get in touch with someone and say, yep, yeah, I'll answer some questions, and you think, shit, what am I going to ask? <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant, no, excellent. Right, what's this one? Um, have you a finite number of people you want to interview, or are you just going to go with the flow and basically decide enough's enough? I need to draw an end. Are you going to say, right, I've, I've got 200, 300, whatever it is you've got, 50? Don't know. Are you going to have a, a specific number? Or I've got um, I've got on my computer, I've got folders for about 250 people that I would like to talk to, but in the course of doing this, that's unrealistic, totally. Uh, I think it was Simon Butler who did graphics for Ocean, mm-hmm. um, and he said if you do that, it'll just be an encyclopedia, which is right. It would be, uh, and it wouldn't necessarily be that good to read, I suppose. And I wouldn't be able to write as much either. I mean, at the minute, I'm, I'm, I'm formatting this so that it's on A4 pages, 
And at the minute, even just one game that I talk about is taking, sometimes it might take one page if it was a not particularly good game and it didn't ask many questions, but anything from one to eight pages per game. So if you think I talk to, say I talk to 50 people and say the average six games each, so that's 300 games, and say I'm averaging four pages per game, that would be 1,200 pages. For <laughs> that's going to be a lot of pages, I. So, you know, I have to draw the line somewhere. And... I think I'll be getting the Kindle edition. <laughs> <laughs> In the bath. Oh, I try to hold this book. First. <laughs> so, I've... I've got a number in mind of how many people I want to talk to mm -hmm. before I say, right, that's enough to make it a good book. Yeah, and, yeah. And we'll see where we'll go from there. Mm -hmm. Cause there's I'm, obviously... getting there though. I'm getting close to that number, I must say. Aye, aye. Good news for your Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was I going to say to you? Um, yeah, I mean, one, I've got quite a few retro books, you know, the Commodore 64 and that kind of stuff. You know, and see like um, Drop Zone, Oh, this Archer McLean classic features blistering graphics, you know, very reminiscent of Defender, it debuted on the Atari, da, da, da. and it's, you tend just to get sort of three or four lines telling you about the game, whereas yeah. uh, you've, I've never read a review, I've never read an article that's maybe three or four paragraphs about a particular game, and I think that would be very interesting. There's going to be games, I dare say, that your book's going to have, I'm going to go, I'm not particularly interested, I don't know that game, I'll move on, but, you know, I think that'll, that'll be interesting to a you lot of people. You might do that, yeah, you might, but on the other hand, if I've got the actual programmer speaking about it, and... and how you went into it and if there was any interesting stories about the program you might feel like you might want to read it you never know mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. uh, and it might actually make you try that game out perhaps I, I, I just think rather than me just picking some games and writing about them which i could do that and i i am doing that actually I, it was like a little side project i started doing i can do that i can write write about a load of games and just do some reviews and put them in a book that would be easy enough i just thought taking this angle People aren't really that interested in what I'm saying. They're more interested in what the other people are saying, the people who actually did the work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That I'm looking at it from. So, yeah, I've got to write quite a lot because I've got to do a narrative to tie things together. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, people are going to be more interested in what they say than what I say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Are you going to try and get somebody to write the narrative for you? Um, Is no, that I'm something doing... you've not thought about? I'm, I'm doing all of it so far. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll try and get someone to do a four-word. Four words, sorry, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know who I'll get. I have to think about it, but it, has to, it would have to be somebody, not necessarily that actually did any of the games programming, but is known to have enjoyed playing games when they were a kid. Well, that's but, Scottish uh, say YouTube sensation, getting a bit <laughs> grey and bald, but <laughs> looks like mid year. <laughs> I can't think of anybody. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we shall we shall move on swiftly. <laughs> Okay, well, listen, Paul, thank you for that. That's all my questions. Um, but what, I, what I've actually done, I think you are actually taking part in it. Um, what I do when I when I pick the, the, the victim, um, I put that to the sort of community and ask, is there any questions that people would like like to ask uh, on their behalf? So I've got a list of questions here. I've got two and a half, two and a half pages worth. Um, I hope you don't mind if I can just go through them. Um, now I've not actually read these before. I'm just going to read them straight off the cuff, so we okay. can uh, we can always edit them out if there's anything untoward. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. Okay. The first one is uh, Jamie Williamson. Thank you, Jamie, for this. Um, he's asking. Okay, Paul, you want them? You've got them. Um, right. What the hell are you playing at? <laughs> That's the best question of all, isn't it? <laughs> I must be mad. <laughs> if I'd known how long it would take and how hard it would be to find people and because uh, that's the hardest bit I don't really have any contacts or anything in the industry so I'm having to try and find all these people off my own bat and some are easy to find and some are really into the whole scene and everything and some are just completely hidden from sight if you if you like it's impossible to get a hold of some people and okay Retro Gamer Magazine can do it and this that and the other um, but little old me that's a bit more difficult so if I'd known how big a job it would have been, I still would have done it, but I, I do think I'm a bit mad sometimes. <laughs> but then when I, start, when I start actually putting the page together and I'm putting the screenshots on and I'm putting the person's comments on, it just it's great. I love doing it. So. Yeah. Have you ever at any point, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm quite, um, you can watch what I'm saying here. A bit obsessive when it comes to like my emulators and that kind of stuff, my games and all that. I mean, uh, just an example. Um, there's an app on the on the iPad where you can play the Commodore 64 games, yeah. and uh, I 
I found out how to add my own games. So I added something like 300 games. But when you were loading it up, it wasn't coming up the screenshot. And it was coming up like, um, instead of drop zone, it was coming up D zone. And I thought, right. no, I want it to be called drop zone. And you could put in the <laughs> programmer's name. And I spent I spent hours. I mean, I'd like, I would hate to think the number of hours that I've spent over the years renaming files and all that. And right. sometimes I get, I get halfway through and I'm like, what the fuck am I actually doing? You know, this is <laughs> bollock and but I've gone so far and I think there's no going back and have you ever got have you ever has there ever been a time you think oh, I'm just ready for throwing the towel in with this or do you just take a rest and think right I'll, I'll have a couple of weeks off and Yeah, that's more or less it. I'll, I might just actually play some games for the sheer fun of it. Um and maybe not do some writing or whatever. I, I do different aspects of it I suppose. If I get to that point, then I start looking through my list and seeing who else can ask some questions or who who would I like that I can actually get hold of. So sometimes I go through and do that instead of actually working on... Because there's different phases to, to the book. There's the actually getting in touch with people, then there's the writing of the questions, and then when, it, when they come back, if they come back, there's the figuring out what you're going to write, and there's taking the screenshots and so on. So... There's there's quite a few different aspects of it. So if I get bored with one side of it, I can do another side. Yeah, of it. yeah, just keep it keep it interesting. Uh, yeah, uh, good stuff. Second question Jamie's asking is: uh, When researching your book, did anyone refuse to be interviewed? You don't have to give any names. On oh, fact, name and shame them. Hell, like go for it. This is this is your <laughs> forum, Mister Moz. <laughs> I'm not going to name and shame them just because I might I might still actually have use for them at some point. Uh, yeah. Of all the ones I've asked, I've only ever had two come back and actually say no, which is not bad. Um, one of them was very, very nice about it. Uh, went into great length as to his reasons for saying no, which I fully appreciated, and then was nice enough to give me lots of advice about the book and advice on taking screenshots and so on and so forth. So that was great. Uh, the other one was a bit ruder, but there you go. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but other That's... than that, it's a... Uh, there's a lot of them where you send emails out and you just sort of send them into the ether, I suppose, hoping that you'll get a reply. And quite a few of them I haven't. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. You have your fingers crossed and then if it's a bust, then so be it. But the, most of the ones that do come back, they're, they're very enthusiastic and happy to help. So Yeah, yeah. Uh, then again, I suppose, <laughs> that's until they see the big list of questions and then you might never hear from them. <laughs> <again>. <laughs> uh, <coughs> excuse me, pardon me. Okay, number three from Jamie is uh, Earliest Gaming Memories. Right, we've already covered that one. How did the love affair with games start? We've touched on that already. Um, right, okay. <clears throat> Excuse me, right. Your top five Desert Island disc games. Not necessarily in disc. It's um, obviously playing the, on the BBC music thing across any format and any particular reason. So what, what it doesn't have to be your top five favourite games. If you were going to get sent to Desert Island for the rest of your life, and you're allowed to get five games that you can play. It doesn't matter. You've got Wi-Fi, the lot. What what games would you take? That's that's just a very, 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 very hard question. That is indeed, yeah. Um, any top five I ever do, I'll always have Paradroid on. I love that game, and I always will. So I'll have that. Um, let's go with... I'll go with the Spectrum next. I'll take... Jetpack for the Spectrum, because I was always kind of jealous that I never got the play. That's a great game. Well, that's a great game, Jetpack. Um, I wonder if I should go in the arcades for something. <laughs> lots of arcade games I love. Well, you can have what you want. You can have a G-Lock, yeah. the full mechanical hydraulic one. I don't have a problem oh, with that. No, don't, be, don't be thrown up on <laughs> Desert Island. Um, take Galaxian, because I never get sick of Galaxian for some reason or other. I love that game too. Uh, yeah. Go on, sick of me. What's your highest score? What's... On Galaxian, uh, about 48,000. I, I think I'm about 20, maybe. Yeah, I'm not not great at it, but, you know, when you see people scoring a million on it, you think, that's not how, that's not even right. <laughs> I think I'm going to take, I've got a choice of arcade Kung Fu games, so I'm going to go for Kung Fu Master, because, I don't know, there's just something about that. And then the last one I'm going to take is one that I can play forever, and that'll be Sid Meier's Sim Golf. I really like just mucking about on it, and it's it's limitless. You can just go on forever messing so about. So sandbox type game, you can create your yeah, own courses yeah, yeah. and can, aye aye. You can play it in two ways. You can have one where you're actually trying to earn money and this that and the other and open new golf courses and stuff. But you can just do what you like, basically. So it's basically Minecraft for the nineties, then is that what you're saying? Yeah, I suppose. Except Minecraft with golf. 
<laughs> interesting combination. But uh, yeah, I never get sick of that. Good. I can put yeah. it on and just have a bit, bit dabble with it. And, yeah. Is that five? I think it is, is it? It's five, yeah. So I'm just noticing uh, Italy have just scored in the last second to beat Scotland at the rugby. No, <laughs> no surprise there then, dearie that, me. That's your weekend destroying. Oh, well, that's it, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, nice like, one. Um, right, the next question. England are going to lose a cricket later, so... Are they? Oh. <laughs> the next one from Mr. Williamson, number five. Do you enjoy modern gaming or just retro? No, no, I like modern games. Um... I haven't got a new console yet from the new generation, but uh, I really enjoyed me 360. I've got loads of games on there that I really like. There's cheapest uh, chips as well, of course, now, eh? That's the system yeah, you, yeah. you can get them for pennies, eh? Oh, I know. You go down, you can, if you had 30 quid in your pocket, you come back with half a dozen games these days. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's pretty good going. Um, yeah, some of, my, some of my favorite games of all time, I suppose, are probably on the 360. I, I've had a really good time with it, but uh, it's just tailed off lately, A, because... I suppose there was less games coming out with the move to the... the yeah, Xbox. there seems to have kind of... Are they still making 360 games or are they kind they of... Are, yeah, they are, but... Are they not, high? But, um, but also, um, I just haven't had enough time with doing this book. Uh, most of my spare time is playing those games for that and, and doing everything around that, so okay. maybe when it's finished, I'll get myself a, a new system and catch up again, I suppose. I really fancy playing that Alien Isolation game. That's how it looks really ah, good. Looks, uh, looks really nice. I must admit, I've, I've just recently got myself a new computer. My computer I had is about seven years old. It's getting to the point. Yeah. The mouse is a USB mouse, and it disconnects and all this kind of stuff. So I thought, I'm going to treat myself to a new computer. And I got that just a couple of weeks ago. And um, I thought, well, I've got to get a, a decent graphics card. I wasn't wanting it for yeah, for yeah. Uh, for gaming, but I've got a decent graphics card. It was a 100 quid the graphics card. and. It's just it's mind blowing, absolutely mind blowing. And see for like for emulation, I mean I'm playing uh, when I do the screen capture stuff. I've, I found the old PC I couldn't record games because it was juddering and stuttering because it's trying to record the screen as well as play it. But I've got this says uh, model uh, Sega Model Two emulator and it's running stuff like uh, Daytona, you know, sixty frames oh, a second. It's just like it's mind blowing. So yeah, and I've got to say, I mean the. There's a thing called Steam, which you've probably, you're, in fact, I know you're aware of. You, you, you get bundles of games for like pennies. I mean, I got a game. It's oh, I can't even remember the name of it. XCOM something or other. It's like a third first person shooter, and it was oh, like yeah. 70, 72 pence. It's like in a, a it's filmed in the sixties, a sort of B yeah. movie. Bro. What's that? The bureau is that it? That's the one. Seventy two pence. How can you argue it's, with that? I've got I've got about four hundred and eighty <laughs> games on Steam. <laughs> And I've probably got six of them installed and you know, that I play. <laughs> Stupid. I mean, and you can't resell but, them or anything. Aye. I've got a mate who sends me emails. I mean, he sent me an email today. The entire Valve collection for 13 quid on Steam, you know. But uh, I've got enough games to, to last me until I, until, I was gonna say, until I retire, until I die probably. So I don't need I any more games. <laughs> I think I don't need to buy these. I've got, got loads already. And then you see another bundle where you get seven games for six dollars or something. You're like, Oh, I can't it's mental, it, yeah. but yes, yeah, so I can. Uh, I, I can. If if somebody was saying to me, "I love retro games, but I love new games," what should I do? I would probably say, spend five hundred quid and get yourself a decent enough computer. You know, it's, yeah. And you can get the best of both worlds. You can get modern games for pennies, and you can also play all the emulators. You know, yeah. absolutely top notch. So, yeah, yeah nice. good stuff. I've completely lost my train of thought. Where were we? <laughs> Desert Island Games, I think. No, no, sorry, we've done that one. Modern yeah. Games. Okay, Paul. Right. Uh, Jamie's saying here, it's fair to say that many games we loved back in the 80s don't really cut it anymore. But what games that you loved back in the day do you still give, do you still enjoy playing? Ooh. Now, how how to answer that without upsetting some of the people I've talked to? I wonder. <laughs> I like a lot of the games from back then. Still, to be honest, um, you I mean, still you still play them. Yeah, I still. Paradroid. Do you play Paradroid? I I'll, I'll always play Paradroid. Yeah, yep. play that when I'm seventy five. I'll always play it and love it. Same with a few of Andrew Braybrook's games like uh, Gribbley's Day Out. It's never going to age. It's always going to be a challenge. Um, so, I mean, I'm not going to go around naming. Names or anything, but I, I think I think I, I think I, 
it depends on your point of view, but I, I play a lot of those games still and for enjoyment, not just because I have to play them for the book. Yeah. I'll play them anyway. Just because still I good games, I. Like game. Yeah. And I don't know if it's entirely nostalgia. It is with some of them. There's definitely some games where they're, they're not really that good anymore and you still get something out of them because you used to play them when you were 14 or whatever. But but um, no, I think a lot of them are still are still worth a blast. I mean, mm. not necessarily a prolonged session. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, they're ideal for dipping in and out of sort of thing, eh? Yeah. I mean, I, I was a C64 man back in the day and I always thought the, the, the Spectrum was utter pants. But now that I've got a Spectrum, <laughs> I've got to say, I mean, I, I've got a, a feature that I do, I don't know if you've seen it, called Arcade Perfect My Arse. And I, <laughs> yeah. I basically, yeah, I look at, I play an arcade game, then I play every version I can possibly get my hands on. And yeah. nine times, I hate to say it, but nine times out of ten, the Spectrum kicks the 64's arse. The Spectrum is a fantastic machine. It's, you know, yes. once you get past the, the glitching and the, the monochrome graphics, it's a it's a fantastic little machine. I was yeah. playing Chucky Egg for the first time, and it's a brilliant game. You know, it, it'll always be a good game, no matter what. I, I, I agree with that. There's, I think good is good regardless. I think a lot of them are timeless. The the look dated, but they're still if they play well, they're, they're always going to play well. I think that, that, it's it's yeah. Uh, I, I'd probably good list a hundred that I would still play today just for mm-hmm, fun. Mm-hmm. So yeah, good stuff. Like this is a a multi-parter question. Okay, um, which which ones do you know? What's that, what's he saying here? Which ones do you play not out of nostalgia, but because you genuinely enjoy it? That? So we've just yeah, covered yeah. that one. These can be arcade. Conversely, which ones did you obsess about back in the day, which you now realise are utter pish? <laughs> hmm. <laughs> you better be careful what you're saying. I'd better be very careful. <laughs> I, I, off the top of my head, I, I, I'm not just doing this to try and sound nice, but I can't really think of any I liked then and don't like now. You probably, yeah, it. because you're, if you're a gamer then, you're still a gamer now, and it's still going to be a good game. It may have not aged quite as well as some games. Yeah, I, I mean... I don't know, I suppose sometimes you wanted to like a game because you liked who did it or you liked the software company or whatever or you'd just been looking forward to it for ages and when it came out and it wasn't as good as you thought it was disappointing so you wanted to like it and you kind of forced yourself to like it and now when you look back on it you think, ah, that was rubbish but I haven't really got too many of them to be honest, I must admit mm-hmm, No, mm-hmm. I can't think of any, sorry Good, <laughs> good answer Okay, Paul, good stuff. Right, number seven from Mr. Williamson. He is asking, what games on other home systems um, back in the day did you feel just a wee bit jealous about that you didn't actually get to play because you didn't own the system? Were there any particular games? Because you were a 64 man, really, well, weren't yeah, you? Yeah. First I and foremost. Uh, I suppose there weren't any technically because I had mates with Spectrums and other computers um, and I could go over to their house and play them, I suppose, but... When it's not at your fingertips, it's not the same. So definitely the um, the ultimate games like Jetpack and Night Law, particularly Night Law. I mean, it was like stunning when when you first saw that, and uh, it was ages before you got anything like that on the Commodore 64. So those two, um, I really liked Death Chase, which you never got on the Commodore 64. Um, mm, yeah, I don't know if there's any on any other systems particularly. Um, Although I did have a mate who had an MSX and they had some great arcade conversions. Track and field, I think. Yeah, and was Nemesis. it Yard Kung Fu, weren't they bad as well, I think? Yeah. I, I, I used to go with Yard Nemesis, which was really good. Um, oh, aye, aye. Because that was one of my favourite arcade games. So I suppose from that point of view, um, yeah, I was a bit jealous of the MSX. But from in terms of originals, yeah, I'll go with Jetpack, I'll go with Night Law, I'll go with Death Chase on the Spectrum because they were all, uh, they were all mm-hmm. really good and, and yeah, nothing really like mm-hmm, the 64. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's funny what you should say that. I mean, my mate had a Spectrum, and there was games that he used to show me, like Night Lore and that kind of thing, and because it wasn't my computer, I wasn't really interested in playing them. Yeah. I would quite happily watch him play it, but I, I didn't want to play them. You know, I think you had to, that kind of game, it's not pick up and play, it's a game you've really got to sort of get to know the sort of the, the ins and outs of the controls. So, I mean, I used to... I used to go over and it was always a case when you go to your mate's house and they'd show you the game and then you'd have a shot and you'd be rubbish at it so they'd be straight back on it and they'd play it for half an hour so I was straight and like that but um, but yeah those are definitely games that I, I yeah. was, was seen on the Commodore 64 is yeah. there any just this, is, this isn't a question that's been written down but it's just one that's sprung to mind is there a a guilty pleasure game is there a game that is absolutely renowned as being crap but you there's something about it you just think is great 
I don't know if it's renowned as being crap, but uh, it didn't review very well, but I absolutely loved playing Rock and Wrestle on the Commodore 64. <laughs> I used to play with my brother a lot, and the two-player game was hilarious, you know, and uh, even the one-player game I used to enjoy, and I, I know people used to say, oh, well, you could, you could have someone on the ground and kick all their energy out of them, and then they'll get back up and they'll pin you, and I was thinking, well, it's like real wrestling, that. <laughs> That was, uh, that was was that not kind of the unofficial sequel to Exploding Fist? Kind of. Sort of kind of. Yeah. I was remember. I remember. I'll be perfectly honest. I remember. I was gutted when I bought that game. Um, and did it all have? It kind of had really rudimentary samples. The speech, yeah, didn't. It was like, and the wee guy with luminous green shorts. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, white noise. Yeah, it did sound like someone was goggling some gravel or something rather than the actual and it, and it had like any Benny Hill sort of tune to it as well. I suppose it did. I'm, I'm like sure. Like, the ring chased me the guy on this was a little bit like that. But, um, but really, actually, for its time, all the moves that you had that you could do, there was loads of different uh, wrestling moves and depending on what position you were in and how you moved the joystick at certain times, you uh, could pull off a lot of moves. So graphically it, wise, it was quite poor the way. I think it was, it was it wasn't the best. And, uh, uh. <laughs> and there wasn't a lot of variety in the characters other than the outfits, but well, you can enjoy playing that, so... Uh, I suppose, yeah, uh, given, given the ratings it got in the magazines and yeah, it was right. Like, I'm trying to. This is this is sad. This is going to really test us or geeking us. What, what, what rating do you think it got? Rock and wrestle. I'm thinking about sixty-seven. I think it got fifty-three percent in zaps. Oh, I think it right. We'll have we'll need to have a look. I'll it. check and I'll post a comment yeah, below this video with it. Could be thinking of something else, but <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll, what's the prize for who's closest? Um, <laughs> hey, <laughs> a free copy of a, a, <laughs> a free ROM download of Rock and Wrestle. How, how good is that? That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> right, fifty-three and sixty-seven. Right, let's. Right, okay, I've I've made my choice. Okay, that's yeah. that's fair enough. Excellent. The the one game that I like, uh, and I've spoken about it before, was uh, we my mate who had the Spectrum. We decided one time. Why don't we swap computers for the night? All right. So he got my C sixty four, the the disk drive, the full booner. I got his Spectrum, and uh, I was going through all the different games and uh, can he play that? Can he play that? And then I stumbled across a game called Formula One by CRL. I don't know if you're aware of it. No. It's be the best way to describe it is Football Manager, but with racing cars. Right. Uh, pardon me. You basically pick your driver and of course you can put your own name in you know this was I mean this was I'm trying to think the name I think Nicky Lauda he was like the the, 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 the the sort of top racing driver you know what I mean they were all you could pick a sort of like different drivers obviously more expensive mm. um, but then and you picked your tyres it gave, it gave you a sort of prediction of what the weather was going to be and you picked whether it was going to be intermediates wet slicks whatever it was called um, and then you basically get it's just like the window of like the finishing line and like your car I always went for a yellow car because it was easy to see and you'd see you'd see the cars going <laughs> and that was you broken down blown <laughs> and then you got this wee this wee kind of pit stop sequence where you control the joystick and you got to control like the putting tyres on but I was absolutely hooked I remember playing it through like three, four o'clock in the morning, it was just it really struck a chord with me. I love the whole. I mean, basically, you're just it's like watching a, like watching F one. <laughs> you know, you're you're not really doing a hell of a lot in the game, but I just love the unpredictability of it kind of thing. Yeah, but I've never heard of that one. That's, uh... Yeah, I think I've done a mashup of it actually. And if I actually noticed that somebody has actually up, updated. Well, they, up, they did it maybe ten years ago. They updated the driver, so I think it's got people like Damon Hill and that in it now. But <laughs> it's still the same crap graphics and that. But I love that game. It's um, a completely unheard of one. <laughs> I'm going to see who wrote it and see if I can get them just because. Aye, and you can you can tell them that that's my favourite Spectrum game. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Good stuff. Um, right. Okay. <coughs> Number eight from Jamie. You know that he's monopolising this video at all. Sure. But anyway, um, do you keep up to date with the C sixty four scene? In fact, I'll just read the whole question. Have you played any of the great new C sixty four games like Prince of Persia? Didn't even know that one existed. Yeah. Soul Soulless. Yeah. Soul Soulless. It's called. Yep. Uh -huh. Night and Grail. Now, actually, there's a mashup in Night and Grail. It's yep. an excellent little game. It is. Uh, and Darkness. Yep. Yep, and if so, what did you think of them? I do keep up with the scene um, because I write for a magazine called Reset, which is about the, the Commodore 64, and 
it's a mixture of old and new stuff and it does a lot of reviews of new games and um, talks to the people who program them and stuff. I've just yesterday sent off a review of uh, Donkey Kong Jr. which has come out on the Commodore 64. Which you kindly sent a link to. I did, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's excellent. really good. Um, and that's by the guy that did Prince of Persia actually. Um, there's some amazing games coming out, it seems like people are finding new things to do all the time or even if not new, just putting so much polish on them that those games were released back in the day. Uh, no, what do you mean? The, the, the just be, they'd blow everybody away. And the, no, I, I. Um, I, I sent you a link as well. There's a new version of Scramble out for the Commodore 64. Yeah. And I didn't really like Scramble in the arcades. I, I, I was no good at it. But it's a tremendous version. It's I, feel, I mean, there was a few came out in the day that, like, Anarog scramble and what have you. That was sort of yeah. That was my favorite. That was one of my favorite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this would have blown them all away, you know. And it's coming out in 2015. It seems bizarre, but it's yeah. It's in, I mean, you, you and I are both self-proclaimed uh, complete dumplings when it comes to like, technical stuff. You know, I can set up game bases, but you know, don't ask me. I mean, step ahead of me. I mean, even it sounds ludicrous, but even like to if if you if somebody loaded a, a basic game of Space Invaders where they're moving and shooting, that would still blow my mind. I think how can you possibly make a game? I just don't understand how yeah. how you can actually do it. So, um, where am I going with this? But yeah, I mean, it, it's I wonder what's changed. It's not like the hardware has changed. What has made? These guys now able to do what they couldn't do ten years ago, twenty years, thirty years ago. We're talking about thirty years ago. Yeah, um, it's obviously just the knowledge and. The I think with Prince of Persia, <laughs> some um, some sort of a, I don't know if, I don't know if it was a hardware thing. I think it is actually. I think they used some sort of new hardware thing for that. Ah, uh, um, but, but like Bandersnatch, then. <laughs> 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 we'll not go into that. I mean, you can't get a tape or disc version of the Prince of Persia game. I think it's a cartridge thing. Um, but obviously the a, a, a downloadable version of it. But other ones, it's just people who have been programming demos and all sorts for years, and they're just really good at it. And, uh, and yeah, bringing these games out that are big and complicated. And I think I suppose yeah, I suppose there's a part of it that could be that because of emulation, they've got the they've basically got infinite. Um, I mean, I, I don't again. It's because I'm not I'm I'm thick. I mean, I don't know whether if you're emulating a Spectrum, could you, in theory, give a Spectrum, you know, 512 meg of memory? I don't know. So, in theory, it's like limitless on an, emul an emulator. I might be talking shite. Maybe somebody will tell me. They're definitely all versions that can run on the proper hardware. So, I mean, someone's mm -hmm. just done a Castlevania game on the Spectrum. is tremendous. Aye. And you wouldn't have seen oh, yeah. it years ago. Uh, it's just, just clever people, that's all. Uh, uh, they've I mean... I suppose the the hardware itself's been documented that much over over the years now that if you think about it, you, you know what it can do and and they're utilising it really well. Mm -hmm. So well done, those guys really. Absolutely. Have you seen the is it Space Harrier on the Atari Eight Bit? That's very impressive. I, don't know if I have. I might have. I might have watched a video at least. Um, I'll have to check that out. Yeah, that's really impressive. It's like a fantastic version. I mean, the the Atari but the Atari was a machine that. Um, I mean, I didn't have, very few people actually had. I think yeah. the problem with Atari was it came out years before anything else, before the, the scene kicked off, and, yeah. you know, it kind of died before uh, it really got a chance to take foothold, but although I'm a C64 man, I still think the Atari 8-bit is the best 8-bit computer. It's a fantastic computer well, when you well, see what it can do. I tend to say that the Atari versions of a game are the best versions, so there's obviously a lot to that. Um, I think, yeah, I think, um, I think part of the reason for that would be is you know, the Atari 8-bit came out in like 1979 or something, so when the Commodore 64 came out, I don't know, 1983 or something, the, the, a game, I don't know, say Fort Apocalypse, which is one of my favourite um, favorite 8-bit games, yeah. um, it's like night and day, the C64, it plays alright, but it's jerky, the Atari 8-bit is like silky smooth, it's because by that, at that point they'd had like six, maybe four or five years experience the Atari, whereas it was a first game in the, the, the Commodore 64, so I dare say, done properly the, the C64 one would be good, but I always remember, I think it was a famous quote a famous quote that I can't even remember what, what it was said, <laughs> it's that famous you know what I mean, uh, Archer McLean uh, and, and ironically it was in I think it was the first issue of Zap 64 mm -hmm. they had a feature um, 
talking to different programmers and saying, you know, blah, 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 what's, how, why do you like programming the, the Commodore 64? Why is it such a good program? And he said, oh, it's great, blah, blah, blah. However, the Atari bit's the best home computer. And I was like, oh, I, you, know, you didn't want to hear that. No, I don't want to know that. <laughs> and I think apparently, I mean, it, it runs... I don't know, um, I'm sure Dio on the rear of the road would tell us this, it runs something like twice the speed or something, the clock speed, it's just, it's, it's a far, far superior system. But, um, I mean, he did Drop Zone and everyone seems to think that the Atari version of Drop Zone is better than the Commodore 64 uh, it's, version. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm only used to the Commodore 64 version. I have played the Atari uh, version, not enough to notice particularly the, the differences, but... I'm the same, yeah. All the programs, I think I mean, it's like, Andrew yeah. Brook said it was better, Jeff Minter said that version was better. Even I think it's the frame rate, is it not? I think there's a higher frame rate or something. Right. I think so that uh, seems to be it. Maybe I should give it a blast. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of other games. I don't know if you... There's a, a system that... I actually put a link to on the way of the road. And mm. There's a, a system that somebody's come up with, or probably two or three people, whereby they can now display a lot more colours in the spectrum yeah. at a higher resolution and there's some games that I played, I can't remember, I played one recently, I did a mashup of it and it's utterly fantastic, you wouldn't know it was a spectrum, you know, and this is the same it. hardware. Yeah, I'm trying to think around what I have seen a couple of them lately and yeah. you look at it and you think, that's pretty... Amazing, cool. absolutely amazing. It's, uh, yeah, it's uh, just the way that people are getting more and more with the old machines, it's, it's really, it, it keeps them alive, and it, it's a good thing, you know. It's not just Here. not just a nostalgia thing. People are doing creative stuff that's that's actually better than back in the day. So yeah, here's a, a question I've always it's always niggled me. Now I've you know I've got a, a PS4, I've got a PS3, I've got an Xbox. I mean I've got hundreds of machines. It's just ridiculous. Yeah, we all but that. <laughs> I, I'll be honest. I mean I play a. I would personally think I personally think that the, the PlayStation has dated quite badly. Don't get me wrong, there's still some classic games in it. Yeah. But you look at things like Tomb Raider and it's shocking. Yeah. Um, no. Even Ridge Racers, you know, that you can see the backgrounds building up. It's it's not aged well. It's it was like the first kind of generation 3D texture kind of type thing. Yeah. So it's not aged well in my opinion. Um, but you look at like the PlayStation Two. There's really not that much a difference. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get people flaming me away yeah, here. Yeah, there's, in my opinion, there's not a great deal of difference between the PlayStation 2 and the Xbox, uh, the PS4. Yeah, graphics got a bit more fog effects and lighting, and obviously the online aspect is a massive thing, but I would... Is there a... If technology had never moved on from, say, the PlayStation 2, would you still be quite happy? Because you're 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 a gamer first and foremost, rather than a, a you know a techie person. Oh, I want to have the latest things. PlayStation 2 might or be the, my favourite console ever. Uh, possibly. Yeah. Uh, I mean, some of the games on whether it was something like Gradius 5, which was fantastic. Oh, or best game ever, isn't it? Yeah. Even now, when when you play that. Don't think. I think doesn't now if the idea is good and it plays well, and some would argue the Shadow of the Colossus maybe doesn't. It's a bit clunky, but as an experience, it doesn't matter. It's it that's fantastic still. Aye, it's um, it's it's a stunning looking game. It's almost like you can't really make, you can't really make that any better. I don't think you know. It doesn't really matter how. Um, how shiny the graphics are, I suppose. I mean, they did a follow-up mm -hmm. res on the Xbox One and the PlayStation 4, 3 and whatnot. Sorry, Xbox 360, PlayStation 3. Um, and it, it looked better, but it wasn't better. It wasn't, it was, you know, it was mm -hmm. still fun to play, but it wasn't a better game particularly. So I, I don't know how much difference all these, and, until the, unless they're making it photorealistic, in which point you're really immersed, I'm not yeah. really sure how much it is. Aye, aye. I mean, the, the step up in graphic quality has is less getting less and less with each. I mean, even like I mean, I've I've just got a new PC and it's got you know I can run games at like nineteen hundred whatever it is and it's like sixty frames a second. And yeah, it, I can see what people are coming from. You know, oh, it's it's really smooth. But this whole frame rate thing is just lost in me. I mean, you yeah, know, yeah. apparently the PS4 runs at thirty frames a second. I still get blown away with that. You know, what I mean, it's. Uh, I'm I'm not a frame rate person. All my eyes, are <laughs> I, don't, I don't don't cotton onto what the difference is whatsoever. But it, it is getting harder to be impressed by graphics. I think, and I think you have to have a a great idea along with the good graphics as well to make it make a big difference. Aye, aye. Okay, number nine by Jamie Williamson. Hey, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> 
You've been warned. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> we should just call this the Jamie Williams and Paul Morrison yeah, show. Blimey, right. Jamie Williams. <laughs> a fellow uh, Newcastle bloke, apparently, who oh, lives well, in uh, he lives in Holland, I think it is. I don't know how a Geordie got come to be about in Holland, but anyway. Well, not that far away, I suppose, technically. What was that word that he accused you of being an M? And that, that doesn't mean anything to me. You actually want me to spit that word out? Is it going to upset people? Mackham. I've that's never Sund- heard of that. That's a Sunderland fan. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I've never heard of that one. Uh, <laughs> so, that's, that's, I'm going to say no more. <laughs> M- moving on. <laughs> okay, Jamie's asking here or saying here, you might also be aware that some talented coders have revisited the C64's commando conversion, improved its graphics and controls and added in the missing levels. They're currently doing the same thing for Ghosts and Goblins. That'll be interesting. Mm-hmm. Do you think this is cool, um, or with the existence of MAME and arcade originals, are they wasting their time? So is there a place for having an arcade perfect 8-bit version when you can fire up MAME and play the arcade version? Hmm... I don't know if you'll ever get an arcade perfect version. It's more like a an interpretation. But I suppose if they're fixing something that for whatever reason didn't work out the first time around. Although Ghosts and Goblins was really good the first time. Although I don't know how faithful. Bloody the hard, eh? Was. Aye. The arcade version so hard. I wouldn't have ever got the the levels that were missing or anything anyway. You know. Uh, <laughs> I think I don't think I ever got past level two in the arcade. Uh, I, I get a bit further on the Commodore 64 version, and I, I really like that. Uh, Commando, everybody knows that it only had three levels and it should have had more, so I think what they did with that was really good, actually. And it's excellent. They've cut the glitching out as well, haven't they? Hey, there's no kind of graphic glitching. You might get the occasional thing, you might say, I suppose, but I, I suppose if you can, why not? It's just a, it's just a, a project, isn't it? So um, if they're doing something that improves the original. The original's still there if people if people mm-hmm. play that. And then this is just sort of an alternate version and uh, I think it's I think it's a good idea. Why not? I think it's yeah to me it's a, you know, ultimately somebody who's not into video games could look at me playing say for example Scramble on the Commodore sixty four, then they say, wait a minute, why are you playing that when you've got the arcade one? That's way better. And they've got a point. I think it's it's partly to do with the, the whole nostalgia and the fact that you're thinking Bloody hell, I'm playing like an arcade perfect uh, arcade game on a Commodore 64. It's the fact that we, we we were there back in the day. We know the restrictions and the limits that were on this hardware. So yeah. to be able to play something that technically shouldn't be possible is what makes it appealing, I think. Eh? I suppose so, and, and you should play that Scramble version 1.1 that came out as well. I'm going to do a mashup of it, yeah. I'll do that tomorrow, actually. It's, it's very impressive. Uh, yeah, there's, I mean, there's no harm in it, is there? It's... Um Either if you don't want to play it, you don't have to, but it, it's fun to see what people can do these days, and uh, if it's fixing bugs or whatever in a, in a game, yeah, why not? Yeah, you've probably, but well, I think you have seen it, somebody linked in the forum, uh, you've probably seen the Jim Bagley version of, is it Dragon's Lair? <laughs> on the ZX81, I'm not kidding guys, it's Dragon's Lair on the ZX81, now I'm guessing it must have some kind of 16k RAM expansion or something. I think but it's got something like that, it's he's also got some sort of expansion where he's streaming the video off an SD card into the ZX81, Yeah. he's going to have it as a playable so game at some point and that just makes <laughs> sense. I mean when you think about ZX81, you'd go to your mate's house and they'd have a ZX81, and you'd play some game where you controlled a letter A jumping over a black square or something, or, <laughs> or an arrow fire in a full stop, and you see, you see Dragon's Lair on it. I always remember reading a review, um, a, an early review of the ZX81, and they said that it can display graphics and it doesn't have any sound, but the processor... It has to blank the screen when it draws the graphics because it's not powerful enough. And I thought, how can you have a computer that you can't actually see what it's doing? <laughs> so, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll blank out for a second and so it'll go blank and then it'll move over there, blank. <laughs> yeah, and in fact, it's running a, a bloody laser disc Dragon's Lair game. That's this obscene, absolutely incredible. the most mind-blown thing I've, I've ever seen. I, I can't understand it. I mean, I, I get that the ZX81, I mean, it's just sort of a host for the... But I don't know. I, I mean, Jim Bagley's <laughs> obviously a clever guy. I mean, his, his Spectrum games were tremendous, but it's just, uh, there's there's no way my brain can compute Dragon's <laughs> Lair running on a ZX81. I think that's that's the, the thing for a lot of these guys. Um, I mean, our very own uh, Juno, um, Juno 6, oh, yeah. he's, he's programmed for the Atari 2600, and I've got another friend 
uh, who sent me a, a rake of games. Um, he sent me four or five Atari 2600 games, which he's programmed. Apparently, there's a flash cart you can get for the 2600, and he actually wrote the software. You know, and what they're doing with these things are just incredible. Yeah, it's, 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 it, there's so many creative minds. It's a great thing, you know. I'll never be one of them. But no, it's no. Are there to you, you and I both. Fuel for me to to play with, you know. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's absolutely mind blowing. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, we've done that one right, and number ten with uh, Jamie again. Yeah, okay. Um, finally, and under duress, I might add, a close friend of mine, Andy Haywood. Ah, uh, yeah. Worked on the special Zap 64107 issue. Yes. Something of, of which he is still proud, as he keeps reminding me. Rightfully And so. in light. And in light of the numerous great releases of the last few years, he wants to know if there will ever be another one, another one, full stop, off it. Well, <laughs> obviously... I'm, Good grammar, Mr. W. I was part of Zap 107 as well, so yes, I'm, I'm mm. very familiar with with Andy and the whole magazine. Uh, there was a lot of time and effort went into that by the, the main people behind the scenes, which were... Craig Grinnell, who I believe is on Retro Gamer's staff. He was the original editor of the original version of Retro Gamer, which I actually preferred, yeah. but anyway. Uh, and there was Cameron Davis, who's a guy who is online persona, is sort of known as Gazunda. He does this thing called Blow the Cartridge, a comic, which is, he does comics about old games. It's actually quite funny, so you should look that up. Um, and also Gordon Houghton had a lot to do with it uh, as, as mm. the editor of it as well mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. but Cameron Davis was the guy who suggested it all the way back and and every now and again the, the topic of Zap 108 comes up and every time it does he goes oh no and I always sort of harass <laughs> him about it and say yeah let's do another one and I think I think the will is there but I don't know how many people have enough time to put into it the ones that did all mm-hmm. the all the donkey work so to speak I, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. likes of me I just did a bit of writing a couple of reviews you know and that that was about it I would mm-hmm. happily get more involved if they wanted that but uh, I can't do any of the technical behind the scenes stuff really oh there was a guy I forget Rob as well Rob the the guy in in Holland he did a lot of the graphics and but, um so he would have to be involved there is a lot of willing behind it, but it's the time. It's just the time. Aye, aye. So was there... the, a lot of the writers and stuff, you know, that they did give us deadlines, and uh, and apparently quite a few people struggled with that. Uh, not me, I hasten to add, although I've missed a deadline for the Reset magazine magazine that I'm writing for today. But um, if people are waiting on deadlines, and I know what this is like, I don't put deadlines on people when I ask for for things. Um, but when people have a deadline that they want to work to and it drags on, it sort of wrecks the enthusiasm a little bit to do another one. Mm-hmm. So I can understand why is it's not really happening at the minute, but people are willing to do it, so you never say never. Never, never say never, yeah. Andy might get his uh, zap head in print again yet, you never know. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, right, that's the last of Jamie's uh, questions, hey, thank God. Jamie, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Where are? Uh, <laughs> Okay, Simon Miller is asking, number one, what's happening to a Game Forever Voyaging blog? Oh, a Game Forever Voyaging. How I how I loved it. I don't know if I have the time to do it anymore. I really should write more about individual games than I am, because I have let the blog side of things slip a little bit lately, and the actual website for The Our Gods was meant to be done as a, not exactly a daily blog, but I haven't done as many of them as I should. So... Yeah, fair play. I should probably do more of that. I will be doing, and I do it every year, although last year was knackered by a toothache, um, but I will be doing on March the 18th a thing called Budget Day, because it is actually the government's budget day, uh, and I can't stand budget day. It's all the same. Oh, yeah, there's 6p on tabs and 5 pence on a pint and blah, blah, and then basically you're going to have loads less money than you had last year. So it's all miserable. So I like to take the day off work, and I sit at home, and I play a load of old 8-bit budget games and I write <laughs> all through the course of the day. And that's my budget day, so I'll, I'll, I'll be doing that on March the 18th. So there's something to maybe look forward to. Good uh, stuff. Anyone's got, any, anyone's got any suggestions for budget games they'd like me to play and write about? Then budget games. Put, put the names forward and I'll... I'll Get Bionic, Gran- Bionic Granny by Mastertronic. I've done that a couple of years ago uh, <laughs> just to see... Oh, it's atrocious. I didn't realise how bad it would be. It really is very, very bad. Yeah. Yeah. I Brian Blood. I think I did that. So, to go by on a granny. Did you? Uh, Brian Bloodaxe. That's actually quite a good, um, quite a good game. That was a budget one as well. 
I've often seen it, but I never actually. And it's got the Monty Python tune <laughs> as well. <laughs> I'll check it out. I'll, um, but yeah, it's it's good fun to do that, and it's it's a good way of writing out games. But I should do more. Um, mm -hmm. I've, I've, but, I've, I've sort of imported the Gamer Forever Voyaging thing onto the the Our Gods website, so it's all there to look at still. But I don't mm -hmm. need to do updates on it anymore, and maybe I will. You end up spreading yourself too thin, as I know, it might, not to my cost as such, but um, if I, me knocking out these videos, I mean, for quite a while there, uh, with me moving to a new company, I didn't actually have a role to play. Yeah. And so I was basically, basically getting up in the morning with nothing to do, so I was knocking out videos just you know, one a day, you know, uh, um, but with me now starting this new job, I'll be on a temporary basis, hopefully it's going to go to full time, yeah. um, my, my, my personal time has just completely gone, so I'm having to do these at night, and what I found was I was getting in, getting my dinner, getting the dogs walked, going straight upstairs into the bedroom to make a video for a couple of hours, and then coming down, and then my daughter's going to bed, and uh, my wife doesn't mind me what I'm doing, but she says, you're, you know, you need to rethink things a wee bit, and I, I totally agree. Yeah, totally yeah, agree. It's, it's getting a, it's getting a balance. It's getting a, a balance between <laughs> life and it is. It's you know, do. not being selfish. It, it, if it becomes too much like a trial, or you're doing it just because you have to, then it's not, it's not as much fun anymore. Then I suppose. Yeah. Uh, but for for me, I mean, the, the amount of behind the scenes stuff I have to do now. For I mean, I'm, I'm learning how to use InDesign all from scratch. You know, just to try and do these boot pages. I've never done anything like that before, and uh, I'm getting better at it. But it takes it takes a lot longer than it probably should just to to put a book page together. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, finding the time to do the other stuff is difficult. Uh, I mean, I've got two kids running around, and I just let them, I suppose. But uh, <laughs> at some point, I have to sort of do the the fatherly thing, you know. So uh, so find the time to do everything, like you say, it is difficult, isn't it? Yeah. No, I can absolutely. It's just getting a, it's getting a, a balance, isn't it? I think. Yeah. Simon's also asking here, what's the fur furthest you've come in terms of designing? <laughs> All right, we know the answer to this one. What's the furthest you've come in terms of designing and building a game over the years? <laughs> Excuse <laughs> me while I laugh. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Me with my technical wizardry. <laughs> um, I've used the I've used some different game maker programs. With I've I've always thought it'd be good to do. And I had the graphic adventure creator, and I had the shooting up construction kit, uh, and then lately I've got things like Game Maker and stuff because the free. And I'm always like, yeah, I'll be able to. Uh, You've got to know how to do even just basic sort of code stuff. I don't know anything about hexadecimal and stuff, thing like that, you know? <laughs> even the shooting up construction kit. I mean, I made a few sprites and background graphics because I wanted to do a Star Force clone uh, when I was. I mean, that's back in the late 80s or whatever, that was an 84 arcade game, I love that hmm. game, but I'll just play the arcade yeah. game, because I can't make one, I've tried, <laughs> I did a couple of sprites that looked okay, um, I mean people say, oh yeah, get Game Maker, there's a free version, it's dead easy, but is it? I'll have to have a look and see. You're still a bit, of, you're a bit of, sort of, yeah, mathematical head to do the programming yeah, side of things, I think. Yeah. You, have to, you have to draw yeah. and pack waves and this, like, and I'm just, I just... I don't think I'll ever have the ability to do that. Other people are just that much better at it than me, and have been doing for so long. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, if I maybe when this boots out the window and out the door and what have you, and finished, and I've got some more spare time, I might have a look at it and see if it's any any good. But I can't see it happening. I'm just rubbish. <laughs> the only the only one I ever got involved with was uh, Gary Kitchen's Game Maker oh, by yeah. Activision. Aye. Um, the furthest I got it wasn't even a game; it was a demo. Right. I'd love to find that. It was a demo and it lasted about five minutes. Like I can remember going to my, my local computer club and d demoing it and uh, everybody was watching this demo and they thought this was fantastic. I'd love to find it, but <laughs> that was before the interweb came about, so uh, it's probably gone and lost in the mist of time. Yeah, you should have gone CompuNet and uploaded the day back in the day. <laughs> awesome. I always remember my mate, he, I mean, he was far more uh, technical than me. He was the guy with the Spectrum. He, uh, he actually learned about a machine code and he, he was wanting, to, he's a big James Bond sort of sci-fi fan, mm. and uh, before was it View to Kill came out, I think it was it, he came up with, uh, he managed to get the ding, 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 he got the wee character, uh, the wee stick man, and then he turned around and like, you know, he had this sort of, and then like the blood, although I think his was just like, instead of blood, it was like, mm, and he just like <laughs> drew, drew a line in, but fair play to him, you know. <laughs> But he never he never got beyond the, the sort of the title sequence. Sam Simon, no, I'll ever manage. <laughs> Not happening. But oh, yeah, we can't all be like Fuseball who wrote uh, Frack. Oh, I know. Frack and the BBC, eh, get. 
Fantastic. And uh, that is the last of uh, Simon's questions. Right, who's next? Good stuff. Right, next one, one of our favourite games, Super Whizball. Ah. Well, I, don't, I don't recall there ever being a super version, was there? Was there a super one that came no, out? No, don't well, think they're all, so. They're all super, I suppose. Maybe that's just his, uh, that's his comment. Super was ball. Okay. Yes, uh, <laughs> I don't know what he's referring to here. What's happened? The site hasn't been updated in ages. Uh, it has. <laughs> it, just, it depends which bit you look at, I suppose. I, I was doing bits... I mean, if you go to the front page, it's just a news page which just says, yay, I've got a website, blah, blah, blah. And I don't really update that. Um, there was a bit where I put excerpts from interviews on, but I've kind of stopped updating that because I kind of want to keep some of the people I've got in it as secret for now because, I mean, there's so uh, many, so many yeah. record publications and websites and so on, and they do great podcasts for hours and interviews and this, that, and the other. And I'm thinking... If I put out there everybody that I'm talking to, yep. they're going to see that and they're just going to go after them themselves. And they'll talk, yep. they'll do a podcast, they'll upload it in, within a day, and that basically ruins everything I've done. So I have to be kind of a little bit selfish about it. From Yeah, you're, you're right. I mean, I, personally, I think uh, the Bedroom Stabilians, they were saying you previews all the time, and that kind of ruined it yeah. a wee bit. Because when I actually got to watch it, I thought, I've seen that, but I've seen that, but I've seen that, but yeah, and people would rather get it, you know, a surprise. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, I've, I've, I've got a lot more people than I, I actually say that I have, just because I'm not updating that. I, I'm, I'm trying not to give too much away, and, and like I say, I don't want other people to pinch some of the exclusive No, I, no, you're, if, you're absolutely right. I mean, I've got some really, really good interviews from people you don't usually hear from, but as soon as it gets out there that they've been interviewed by me, they might be all, they might be half a people go back and steal your thunder, out, you know? yeah. And, and then what, what's the point? I mean, it would still be a point of me doing it, but it would mm -hmm. sort of lose a bit of its impact, I suppose. Mm -hmm. So I'm not really putting anything new on there. Uh, the actual blog bit of the... I'm, I'm doing stuff now and again. I put little clips and little little bites on there but uh, yeah it's, I'll hold my hands up to that I'm not updating as much as I should so I think sometimes even putting wee teaser bits up so you know you wouldn't, can't believe who have, who have managed to get on board to keep people well, I can't, you know I it's, it's, it's bad I suppose because I, I have got a They Were Our Gods Twitter and Facebook page so I do put little things on there um, because it's just dead quick and easy to do you know just a just a three sentence comment on Twitter or Facebook Um so by all means, if you if you use those outlets, then have a look and uh, and I'll be spouting rubbish on there a bit more often than I do on the blog because I feel like <laughs> the blog has to be a bit more substantial. So mm -hmm. um, maybe that maybe that's the way to go. Maybe if people have a look at those things and I'll, I'll answer questions there as well or whatever you know. Yeah, funny. I, I got asked a question in my Friday waffle just just the other day. There, he said uh, he's this guy's starting up a, his own YouTube channel, and he's saying he's been told that the way to promote your channel to get more people on board is to get a Facebook page, Twitter account, blah blah blah. He says, "How have you found that?" And I mean, I, I personally keep my my retro side of things completely away from Facebook. Mm. So the only people that can see my Facebook are friends, and you know, most of yeah, these people aren't yeah. interested anyway. But um, I. One, I mean, the the whole Twitter thing is has completely completely passed me by. I don't, I didn't understand Twitter up to a couple, of, yeah. maybe three, four months ago. And one of the guys, I think Binary Zoo, Chris, he's, I think he's on Yak Yak. Um, he said, look, you need to get on Twitter. He says that's the way forward. So I've now got my videos automatically pinging a a tweet. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I completely. I mean, I, <laughs> when I first opened up my Twitter account, I was typing sentences, and it was like. Post. How come the post button's blanked out? This is shite. <laughs> and I realised that I was like, you can't put 400 words in a tweet. Oh, <laughs> Alright, okay. So I don't actually do any tweeting at all other than it automatically uploads. Um, so with this video, when it goes live, it'll tweet. And hopefully yeah, people will... Hopefully, people in your tweet uh, Twitter will yeah. pick it up as well. And that's how you can... Yeah, that's a good way of spreading the... Yeah, spreading it. But Facebook, I've, I've got a separate page just called They Were Our Gods, and you can do that. You could do a page. It keeps it completely separate from your private Facebook account. So, you know, you could do that and then just post the link to your video every time you do one on the mm -hmm. actual page. You could call it, I don't know, uh, what do you, uh, it's just, what's this, what's your YouTube channel called? Is it just nah, it's just Meme Meister. It's, it, it was called the 10 Minute Mashup, but I've kind of moved away from that. It's just Meme Meister. Alan Stewart, I can't get rid of the Alan Stewart, but Alan Stewart yeah. Meme Meister. 
You could do that. You could set up a Facebook page with, and just put I, all your videos on it like that. I an actual page because I think yeah. uh, there was a there was an outcry a few weeks ago. People who don't use their real name. Mm. Saying that the Facebook privacy are saying you can't do that, but I suppose if you set up a, like a community page, yeah. rather than an individual person, yeah. So I could I could do that. That's oh, something that's I'm probably going to do. Yeah. The Twitter page, I get more followers on Twitter than I do on Facebook for some reason or other. I don't know if it's because it's quicker and easier to, to mm-hmm. check Twitter, but um, yeah, give it a shot. Yeah. It's dead easy. But to do. Aye. Well, if we if we can do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I managed it, so you definitely can. <laughs> right, he's a uh, super whiz balls also asking here. You're my age. You have a wife and a kid. He's only got one, obviously. When do you find the time for gaming? Do you how much how much roughly gaming wise well, time do you have? What's handy is when I moved in this house I'm in now uh, a while back. Uh, it's got an outhouse, so I just go and lock them all in there, and then I can get on. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's difficult. Um, my wife works shifts, so she quite often does two or ten. So, uh, if she's doing a shift like that, once the kids are in bed, then it gives us a bit of time where there's nobody downstairs or in that or whatever, and I can just do whatever I like. Um, so that's that's pro- pretty much how I do it. Uh, the eldest's 14, so once the little one's in bed, he tends to not want much to do with me. The the eldest, you know, but once they get to that age, it's just like the, the, oh, he's exactly like how, like Kevin and yeah. Kevin combined, you know, he's a typical <laughs> teenager, wants nothing to do with his parents as much as he possibly can, unless he actually wants something, so, um, <laughs> so I, I do get a bit of time a few days a week like that, but yeah. certainly nowhere near as much as I used to have, or as I would, I would ideally like, but that's the compromise, isn't it, that's the trade-off. Yeah, I must admit, it's, it's pretty obvious um, in your own either Facebook or forums or whatever, it tends to be the gamers that are on at two o'clock in the morning. Yeah, that's <laughs> I, I I must admit I get to two o'clock and I'm I mean I've got I've got sags under my eyes just now I'm just knackered. But I, I, I yeah, it's, it's uh, in the morning because that's what time I've woken up on the couch after I've dozed off. <laughs> it's not like it used to be. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. That's the last one from Super Wizball. Um, now Mark called Lactobacillus Prime is saying have you met Alan Stewart obviously not I'm guessing he's not talking about the, the, the famous panto dame <laughs> up in Scotland but uh, myself yes <laughs> well we have we've met we've only met once haven't we we have actually because in a hotel room in, uh, <laughs> in Newcastle you, can you elaborate on that a bit please <laughs> yeah, that does sound a bit wrong yeah we've known each other for since 2000 I think it yeah, would probably been, be yeah um it's like a lot of these guys, I mean, I've known them for long and I've known some like real life people who I see in real life. But uh, yeah, we've only actually physically met them once. Um, obviously, you're down there, I'm up here. Um, and it was, uh, I gave you Game Base, right. which uh, it's a f- utterly fantastic uh, front end for all emulators with ROMs and that kind of stuff. And I think if I remember rightly, we, I was I was down in business, yeah, staying right. overnight in a hotel, and we met up, and we, you brought your laptop into the room, and I configured game base for you. <laughs> Just set it away, and then we went out for a couple of days. <laughs> the rucksack on your back. But it, it, it did look a bit strange, carrying this. But we did, back. seeing that, we did go out for a, we went out for a, a bite to eat, I think, yeah, later on. We did, yeah, we did. We did, aye. So, can I, can I, do you mind if I ask, have you found game base quite, quite useful <laughs> in this? Massively useful, it's been in... If I didn't have it, I would be, well, I wouldn't be absolutely knackered, but, you know, the amount of time it would take to, to go on the internet and look things up, but you just, you Aye, game that you remember, and, you, and you, you go on Game Base, and so many times it's got the programmer there, and this, that, and the other, so, it, yeah, it's, it's a fantastic it's thing, yeah. from that point of view, I mean, from there, you can, you can go and look on World of Spectrum, or Lemon64, or whichever other website, and find out a bit more information than is on Game Base, possibly. But it's, it's been absolutely brilliant, yeah. So I'll have to give you credit in the book. Oh, well, <laughs> I only gave you it, I didn't. Uh, it's all well, the, the, there's the, no way I could ever set that up because I've tried before and it just doesn't. It's, it's a bit of sword, I must admit. Me. I'm hopeless at setting things up. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, well, it's been, it's been worth it. Uh, good stuff. But, uh, but yeah, the amount of times where there's been events on that. We would both have wanted to go to, but it it end up where, where either you went or I went, but never both. Aye, time was bizarre. That's right. That's right. It just uh, the, the cost implications of doing stuff like that as well. Cost or just other things all... going on. I mean, Aye. Uh, the the London trips. I I went to two or three of those, but it was on years where you didn't go, and you'd been on the other ones that I missed. So the retrovision stuff. That's right. Yeah. So yeah. 
Magic. Right, yes. Next one is uh, Anthony Stiller, uh, Ben's brother, apparently. Yeah. And the real question, did you start with developers of your favourite games and expand from there? If so, which games? I'm trying to think how I did start doing it. Um, I suppose that's probably how it was, yeah. I would, I would play my favourite games and... and because I've got a big folder on my computer, uh, and in that folder there's hundreds and hundreds of folders about different people, and in those folders about the different games and so on. So um, I've done masses of, of research, I suppose. And yeah, I suppose I probably just thought I'll play some of my favourite games, and then I don't know how it spun off from there, but it just grew massively. But um, so obviously I'll play Paradroid <coughs> or you know uh, International Crawley with the Exploding Fist and. Uh, all these games I used to love when I was a kid and make a folder about either the game or the person who programmed them when I found out who it was and I'd find out which other games they programmed if I didn't already know. Um, so I suppose, yeah, that's probably a, a good way to describe it. Yeah, play play my favourite games, see who programmed yeah, them, see who yeah. did the graphics, see who did the sound and, uh, and, and just expand from there. Uh, I think, really yeah. another way of doing it I suppose I think that's a natural way you know you're going to if you're going to write about a hobby you're going to focus on the, the things that are dear to you you know things that you enjoyed yeah I mean obviously the intention was at first just to do British programmers um, so that made it a bit easier to narrow down I've expanded that a bit so I've got Australians and I've got Europeans and I've kind of kept America out of it a bit because um, I feel that America and Japan get Far too much coverage anyway. Already, mm. yeah, they were the they're the best, and there's no no other game in industry other than America and Japan and and Activision, no, and Atari. Yeah, you're right. Something you're right. The, yeah, the video game crash. There was no more games in 1983 until Nintendo <laughs> rode in on their white horse and saved the day. And it was like, oh, we were playing computer games all you know, <laughs> thousands aye. from local programmers. So it's like, yeah, let's concentrate on the, the people that we knew and loved back in the day. Mm -hmm. uh, and let's educate the rest of the world that it's not just America and Japan that did brilliant games, but we did as well. Mm -hmm. so yep, quite right. Great. Good, good point. Good point. Right, uh, Nova Bug. Uh, Chris, <coughs> Chris is asking during your research for the book, which developer impressed you the most with your with his talent, and vision for gaming in the eighties? You can, don't have to answer that one if you don't want to. I mean, but it's a tough question. Um, I'm guessing there's quite a few, probably. I, I mean, I, I don't suppose the research thing really came into it. I, I suppose it's just, you think about the games that you played and how technically impressive they seem to be. Uh, I was always impressed by the, the polish on Andrew Braybrook's games, and I was, I've was i been lucky enough to talk to him, and he elaborates on some of the thought behind that, which is always good stuff to read. Uh, I was always impressed with Jeff Crammond and how... how his games work. I mean, very technical. Eh? I yeah, mean, stuff like Red was, was amazing and Sentinel. Uh, yeah. Sentinel. I've, not that I've talked to him, but if I ever do, and I would love to. Hi, Jeff. If you're out there, just you know, get in touch. Uh, <laughs> but his games were always technically amazing, and I mean, how he come up with an idea like the Sentinel, I've got no idea. It's just just tremendous. Mm. Uh, and I'm trying to think who else I had in mind there. Paul Walks. Paul Walks with um Encounter and Mercenary, they were, they were things that you, you never even thought you'd get on the Commodore 64. Yeah. Um, and But I mean, there's there tons of them, you know. It's, uh, but those, those names spring out. I'll never talk to Paul Wokes either, probably either. Uh, I don't think he's ever done an interview. He's, uh, by all accounts, he's, he's not particularly keen on them. So, but if he ever feels. It's, it, yeah, it's, fun, it's funny how. I mean, I, changing the subject a wee bit, I mean, I, as you know, I do a bit of running. And, you know, people will always, I mean, the furthest I've ran a race was like 95 miles. And yeah, that's a mental distance. And uh -huh. when I see people, people, oh, yeah, they always talk about that. They always talk about that. Right now, I'm I'm running like a bag of potatoes. I'm struggling with the running big style. Um, I've got the race in four months' time. I'm really struggling with my running just now. And right now, I don't feel, I don't feel, I don't feel like I'm a runner. Um, and people going about, oh, you've, oh, you've run 95 miles. That was then. I'm not now, though. And in some respects, they probably look upon that as well. It's like actors, you know. If you're, you know, talking to Sylvester Stallone, you're going about how wonderful Rocky was. 
he's probably thinking, well, what about my latest film, you know, I mean, and it's the same with programmers, they're probably looking upon that, well, this was something I did as a kid, is, yeah. why are you interested in it, it was 40 years ago, it's crap, you know, it's... it's a lot it's, of it that is just too hard to remember, because it was that long ago, I mean, can you remember what you did in 1985, you know? It's, yeah, it's well, actually, 1985, I, I do, yeah, that was actually, <laughs> I do have a lot of memories, I've got a diary as well, but, bad example, cases, 1993, yeah, I can't remember, yeah. Yeah, but, but I mean, generally speaking, most people are quite happy to talk about it. Like I mentioned earlier on, but most people that, that have got back to us and they've said, yeah, apart from the, I mean, there was one, I think it was one of the first people I ever contacted and uh, I probably worded the question wrong when I asked if he would like to take part because he said, of course I've moved on, it was 27 years ago. I was like, okay then. <laughs> uh, so I've sort of worded my questions differently now when I, when I ask people if they want to be in it, but most people are enthusiastic still. And yeah. Some are very enthusiastic and very helpful, so it, it's and, and of the opinion that this is a sort of thing that's not really documented well enough and should be, so... Um, so that keeps me at it, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, thanks for that, Chris. Um, right, another moving on, another Chris Binary Zoo. Mm-hmm. Actually, have you heard? Do you, do you know Binary Zoo makes uh, some utterly fantastic twin stick shooters? I have seen that. Yes. Uh, ah, I've brilliant! I really, I can't recommend him thoroughly enough. He's done quite a few different games. Yeah. Um, I think I've, I've mashed up a couple of them actually, but brilliant. Yep, definitely. Yeah. Really yeah, worth worth looking out for on the PC, and they're all free as well, so Done good stuff. The game, although, uh, you, uh, I mean, it's uh, they could probably charge a, a decent amount of money for some of them. It's the same with that high dollar game, you know, you could, you could charge a decent money and people would be willing to pay it, I'm sure. Yeah, even even like 4 99 or a fiver, you would pay it, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Get more of fun on the case. <laughs> 2 99 Make a fortune. <laughs> Okay, right, Chris is asking here, uh, <coughs> excuse me, well, he makes a comment at the stop here, if Paul objects to being called a Geordie, then I withdraw my book pre-order. Rumour has it he's a Macam. So I hope Chris hasn't got any more questions, because obviously I'm not going to answer them. <laughs> Just at the very suggestion that I might be a Macam. <laughs> I'm only joking. <laughs> uh, Chris's first question is, uh, let's alienate half the audience before we start. Commodore or Spectrum? Oh, One word oh. answer. That's not fair. I'm, I'm supposed to be strictly neutral because I'm writing a book about everything. I'm <laughs> trying to do BBC, Amstrad, all sorts if possible. Um, but the, it's harder to get hold of those people. If I have to nail me colours... Go to go for it. Commodore or Spectrum. Come on, put yourself in a light. nail me colours to the <laughs> mask then. I, I did own a Commodore 64 and so... I'm so what are you saying? You're like a politician. Come on. Yeah, <laughs> Commodore or Spectrum. That's, that's the one I preferred. The Commodore 64. Commodore. You've heard it here. Okay, guys. That's half your pre-order pre- sales go down the tubes. Well, there's some <laughs> tremendous spectrum people in, in the book, so, you know. Right, enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. Your top, or five your favourite Sid tunes. He obviously knew what was coming if he's put that bit in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's, there's like anything, a, anything. There's so many. That's the there thing. is. There's something like 32,000 Sid I mean, tunes I, out there. Back in the day, I, I used to stand there, I'd play it a a piece of music and I'd stand there with a cassette recorder up to the TV and record it so I could listen to it on a <laughs> You'd walk, man. What, what I go with? I'm gonna I'm gonna try and be varied because I could just say five Rob Hubbard tunes. I will say Monty on the Run because that was just mind blown. That's my favourite awesome. It's a it's a cl- I mean I've actually have you heard the Chris Abbott version of that? Oh well, yeah, yeah. It's I mean I I've got that on, on in my car and it's a it's an utterly fantastic PC music, yeah, it really is. It's like pure, it's brilliant. It is, it's great. Um, it's like the Bohemian Rhapsody of <laughs> Sid music, it's, it's fantastic. Just, you didn't realise, I mean, it, it completely blew away the idea that computer games just did this bleepy, bloopy sound effect thing, and I mean, it was like nothing else, so I'm always going to have a soft spot for that. Um, <coughs> I will go with Driller by Matt Gray, which that's an absolutely fantastic piece. Not aware of that one. Never no. played Driller? Oh man. It's a, it's it's kind of like a. I know what driller is. Yeah, it's the is it real scape or something the, they called it? Eh? Yeah, but and it's it's very slow, but the atmosphere that the music gives it. Is it really? It's aye. kind of a bit like um, Halloween. The music from Halloween. Oh, no, right. It's inspired by that, and also Phantom of the Opera was an inspiration. Apparently, uh, it's very very moody. Uh, it's about nine minutes long. You definitely should listen to it though, because it's tremendous. Right. Hey, okay. Um, yeah. I am going to say. Just to try and vary it a bit, because it could all be Rob Hubbard. I'm going to say Platoon. You ever play Platoon? I played it briefly, it's quite difficult. That's I think I kept right. getting caught in the wee traps all the time. Yeah, it's quite a difficult game. Yeah, it's, it's 
it is difficult, but it's really good. But the, the loading music for that's really, really good. Um, so I'll go with Platoon. Um, I will say Parallax. I remember st mm. side, uh, I still have to say computer. Martin Golby, yeah. For half an hour listening to that a couple of times uh, when it came out. Um, so I've got four different ones there. Uh, I'm going to go back to Rob Hubbard. I'm going to say Crazy Comets because it's just so funky and great and excellent. So. But I could have named loads of other ones. Yeah. But those are five for now that I really, really like. Brilliant, brilliant. I must admit, my favourite, or the most impressive sound that the Commodore's ever made, in my opinion, is the bagpipes in World Games. Aye. That is phenomenal, is, is the bagpipes. Yeah, <laughs> Whoever programmed that is, <laughs> deserves a medal. This shows how versatile that, that chip was, doesn't it? Yeah. Aye, and even the wee guitar rift when you die in Wizball as well, yeah. Martin Galway, the wee sort of guitar thing, superb. Nice one. Um, okay, we've done that one. Um... Chris is also saying I was also impressed. I was I was always impressed by how many objects and effects uh, Jeff Minter could throw around on the screen. The lovely animations in International Karate or the speed of Cosmic Causeway. Technically, which game impressed you the most, given the hardware available back then? So impressed you from a sort of technical point of view, rather than like Ch Chucky Eggs, a great game. It's yeah, not very technical. It's quite hard. Any to look at. I will say I've never played it in the day. <coughs> but there was a game called Space Rogue, which was sort of an elite type game, but had filled in 3D vectors and. This in the C64, is yeah, it? Yeah, oh, no, is it really? Uh. You wouldn't believe the speed they move around at. It's it's amazing. So, but that's in retrospect because I never played it in a day. I think mm -hmm. the one I can remember most is probably Turrican. When you get the end level mm. bosses in Turrican, you think bloody hell. I mean, things that were bigger than the size of the screen were attacking you, you know, and they're, they're just really uh, mind-boggling at that. So um, I'll I'll put that mm. one forward for. The yeah, I think I mean it's not it's not a game I particularly like because it's too difficult or I'm just rubbish as Euridium. I mean it, it's a as I know we're talking about like we don't know about frame rate, but that's such a sulky smooth game. It's like. Wow! It is the polish, like I said before, Andrew Brave. It's incredible. Really, really polished, or yeah, possible. And then he goes back and for a couple of them and does even better versions. To you know, there's a Uridium plus. That's right. Yeah. Extra Paradroid versions where he tinkers with them and updates them and makes them better. So, so yeah, uh, mm -hmm. I agree. I'll never, I'll never forgive Mr. Braybrook though. In fact, I wish you'd, uh, you could ask him that question if you hadn't done it. Um, did you, did you ever see the type in in Zap ah. sixty four? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> to increase your speed by twenty percent. <laughs> I, I did ask him about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did you? Right, don't don't tell me the answer. <laughs> I'm still looking for him. <laughs> <laughs> it's, his location's a closely guarded secret. <laughs> <laughs> uh, bro, <brilliant. coughs> excuse me. Okay, the next one from Chris is uh, Atari have recently announced they are remaking Asteroids as an MMO. What's that? MMO? Massively multiplayer online. Game. All right. Seriously, hmm, that's what he's asking. Mm. Which classic deserves a remake? Well, Asteroids doesn't deserve that one, I don't think. No. Um, I, I heard they were making a film about Asteroids as well. Like, <laughs> How do you do that? I mean, it's, it's got that. Rock Hudson and uh, Chuck Rogan. Yeah, <laughs> it's another asteroid. Let's shoot it. Hmm. Uh, which classic deserves a remake? I'm going to have to upset you by going back to Andrew Braybrook again, because this is one I've, and I've mentioned it to a few people before. I would love to see Ali Cat. But instead of having the top-down view, having the view like you get in car games from behind the car. So have a view oh, right, aye, aye. Sort of, right, aye, aye. As you're sort of third person almost. And so on, because there's not really any race and shooting games around, uh, to my knowledge, that, that really work. They're all... They're all just racing games. You've got you got wipeout kind of, that's kind of yeah, sort of shooty. So. Yeah, shooty. you get weapons on that, I don't mm -hmm, know, I don't one game, it's, yeah, it's I mean, one, one thing of the, having the, the different courses and you're having to do slalom courses, and obviously there was a little bit of a, a flaw in that way. On some of the courses, you could just fly right up the right hand side of the screen, and you'd be okay. But if it was, if that was ironed out and had the different track types, I mean, I think it'd be really good. Yeah, I would play yeah, that. Yeah, nah, 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 that's an interesting one. Good. Okay, number five by Chris. Uh, some of the box art and magazine adverts back then were proper works of art. From the iconic Atari boxes, the classic elite box art, and favourites of mine like Sanction, and Wizball, and Bruce Lee. Do you have any favourite sort of box art? Um, or was that something that didn't really float your boat? No, it absolutely was. And I'm talking to box art um, 
books artists, cover artists for my book. Actually, I've talked to a couple already. Um, in terms of a favourite one, it's quite hard. There was so much. I mean, you'd, it was a big part of buying a game. Sometimes you buy mm. a game because of the art. You look at it and you see something. <laughs> no, and game shape. Well, yeah, exactly. But you'd see something tremendous on the shelf and you'd pick it up. Oh, look at that. And then you'd look at the back and think, oh, it's probably good. You, or even if it, it was a game you knew you wanted, you'd be going home on the bus or whatever and you'd be looking at the cover art and so on and the, the, every part of it. So it was a big part of it. And I definitely think those guys need a bit more. I mean, Bob, was it Bob Wakeland? He's done some classic Bob stuff. He eh? did. Yeah. yeah. There's that Steiner Lund who did all the Llamasoft covers. Oh, like aye, that's Ninja aye. or what have you. Uh, mm -hmm. I've just been talking to David Rowe, who did things like the Sentinel and Way of the Exploding Fist and oh, Delta right, and right. Ball. But he also did all the art for the Nightmare TV show, which was really impressive. And he's got a he's actually got a book out with all that art in, which is something people could check out. Um, mm -hmm. For one particular so favorite, one particular, one, would you say? I think, yeah. I think, and I have a reason for it. I'm, I think I'm going to say Sanction, and I'm going to say that because I liked it so much that I actually tried to draw it. I used to like copying the cover or like adverts or things. <laughs> um, so I tried to draw that and I had a piece of, I don't know, it was A1 or A2 paper. So I was transcribing it from the little piece of cover art and I was doing it massive, blown up on this <laughs> thing. And I actually did. It was do, it was coming along quite nicely and I had it on my wall all in pencil and what have you. Uh, and then my brother destroyed it with DOS, which was really <laughs> nice of him. So that was the end of my art career. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I like that. I was quite striking with the spaceship swooping through the. the ah, I, ah, yeah, I can picture it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tremendous. Ah, oh, brilliant. Smashing. Um, okay, and I think is this the last one from Chris? I think it is. Yep. I believe you are covering magazine reviewers in your book. I used to get as excited over a new Zap magazine as any game. How important were magazines to you? Totally important. I mean. It was obviously it was the the way you would find out if a game was worth buying or not, and I used to read all of them. I mean, that was my favourite. But I used to go into the shops and buy and look at <laughs> what a Commodore user and CMBG, and I'd look at Crash and this, that, and the other. Um, but that was the one I bought, and yeah, I mean, reviewers were who who didn't want to be a reviewer, you know? A, a, yeah. Review, that, the dream job back then. Uh, and I think they were a big part of the whole. The whole. Cause that's all you had. That was the basis. You know, back then a game was like ten pounds or whatever. It's a lot of money, and the, the only basis you had was either if your mate told you it was good or crap, yeah. or else a magazine review. I mean, exactly. You know, the number of games that I bought that you know turned out to be absolute pish. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got a mate who was like that. He was, uh, especially when he got his Amiga, which made it even worse. He looked at the screenshots. Oh, and think, oh look at the screenshots on this, and you go and spend twenty five pound blindly on. Based on screenshots, and you get the game, and you're like, oh, oh no. So, uh, the, fa the famous, the famous tale I've got with that one was uh, back in the Amiga days. My mate and myself, we couldn't afford a game each every month. So what we did was we used to chip in. We would buy one game between us, mm -hmm. and one month he would get to pick. Well, we'd, we'd decide between us what game we're buying. He would get to keep that game. Then the next month we'd buy a game, and I'd get to keep it. Yeah. And I can remember uh, going into Edinburgh Virgin Mega Store. We bought Street Fighter the original on the Amiga. And we came back to my house on the bus. My mate went in to put, put the kettle on and I loaded it up. And by the time he'd came through, I'd completed the game. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely shite. <laughs> and it's your game, by the way. <laughs> I've got a bit of a story like that. It's not exactly the same, but uh, maybe mate, we used to buy games and we'd go to each other's houses and play them. And I remember once, uh, I don't know why we weren't at college or whatever, I don't know, but we went to town and he bought Target Renegade on the Commodore 64. And... Uh, we went back to my house because everybody was at work. So I, I brought the telly, I brought the Commodore 64 downstairs onto the, the big colour telly. And uh, because it was my house and my computer, I got to play first. And I went and completed <laughs> it with them sitting watching it. I felt really bad. And if I play it now, I can't do anything. <laughs> it's really hard. <laughs> it's a difficult game, the first time I put it on, I just waltzed through the whole thing. And he saw the engine and everything. And I was like, <laughs> And do you still not speak? I take it, no? No, no, I still it was me. <laughs> but anyway, my lesson Paul that is the end of all the, the, the readers questions I've just got three very quick ones uh, just to finish this off mate um, when do you reckon the book will see a release have you got a rough are you going to draw a line in the sand I am going to draw a line in the sand and it's going to be when I get to a certain number of people and I'm approaching that number and then obviously it's going to take a lot of hard work to get it into shape uh, and then you have to consider all the options of how are you going to do it even things like if you do an electronic version, you probably have to do two versions because you have to do a landscape and a portrait version for people because some people mm. like to read it 
with the Kindle or whatever and have it in sort of traditional book setting. So that could take forever. I don't know. I'll have to have a think about it. Ideally, I would love to have it out at the end of this year because I've been doing it for a while. Um, so I'll, I'll aim for that. Uh, but don't put it on your Christmas list yet because it might <laughs> But it'll certainly, it's certainly not going to go beyond next year, but really I would love to have it out this year. Good. I mean, I'm getting on in years, mate, and there's no many Christmases <laughs> left in me, so... Yeah, I've got to say that, <laughs> I'll grasp it with my dying hands. <laughs> <laughs> right, you've already touched on that. I've got here which format will the book take. Um, obviously, you mentioned you're going to do it electronically, which I think would you'd be mad not to, yeah. not to do that. Hang on, is that the door? Or is it just the wind? I think it's the wind. Uh, yeah. Corey, so you're going to go... Electronically, and you're also going to look to, you know, get. I mean, I know my my father. He he's he wrote quite a few books uh, in his kind of history books, and there are websites or companies out there. You know, you can you tell them how many pages, etc., and they'll give you a cost. You know, twenty two pounds per book, sort of thing. So yeah. presumably, you're going to have the option to to buy it and it sort of I'm hard. Gonna, I mean, yeah, I'd love to have a printed version. It might be that I have to do the old dreaded Kickstarter thing for that. Who knows? Um, mm -hmm. But. We'll just see how it goes. But I, I mean, I, if I'm going to write the book, I want to have one I can hold and look at. You know, so I did this rather than just yeah. a load of graphics on this. That's a coffee table. I think it's going to be a coffee table. By the sounds Probably of things, is, yeah. It's, uh, in fact, you might need to have two people to be able to read it. But <laughs> <laughs> the pages it's going to have. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. And very last question, Paul. Have you got any plans for a follow up? And if so, when would you you reckon that would start? Well, obviously, if I did a follow up. Uh, it will be ready for the year 2030, so bear that in mind. Uh, Christ, I'll be 63. So I, I <laughs> <laughs> My eyes, you need to make big, I, I'll need to be the Kindle when I get, I can, I can zoom in. It's not that I've got a follow-up in mind, but the way things are going when I talk to people, I, I always tell them because I'm really appreciative of the time, but on the other hand, so I say I don't have a deadline, I don't want to push people, but on the other hand, it can take so, so long for people to get back sometimes. And I understand they're busy or yeah, they get yeah. about it or whatever. And I keep giving them gentle nudges. So when I get to this line of, of the number of people I want in and I, and I do it as a cutoff point, if anybody hasn't got back to me by then but is still going to, then obviously that will be... Going to next to start volume two. So, so it's definitely something that can happen and probably will happen. But at, at the minute, I'm just concentrating on doing the first one and and seeing where we get with it. And have you thought about the, the title for that one? <laughs> what, for They Are Our Gods? They, they used to be our gaming gods, but are sadly no longer here. <laughs> I've, got another, I've, I've, I've actually got another book idea in mind as well, so uh, a little spin of sorts, but that, that wouldn't have any sort of... That would be just down to me. Uh, did you have yeah. a, there's a book called Specky Nation, which is great. Uh, ah, I've got that one, basically yeah. Basically, it yeah. just takes something like 50 games... Uh, and it's the author's opinion of those games and why they're so important to the spectrum. It's mm -hmm. really a Commodore 64 version of that, so I thought, yeah, maybe I'll do that afterwards. Maybe bite, bite size yeah, just, type you know, publication. Aye. Pick, pick 64 games that were mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Commodore 64, that I guess, sort of icons and, and write about them. Yeah. It's, good, it's an option, but we'll see. I've got to get this one. Watch, watch the space here. This one goes first. Eh? So, yeah. And listen, Paul, that is it. Uh, thank you very, very much for uh, agreeing to be my guest on this uh, feature. And hopefully. Thanks for thinking. Hopefully. Of, uh, important enough to be on. No, listen, it's, I mean, it's, you may not be the most uh, well known person, but I mean, I, this thing that I'm doing. Uh, it's it's going to be it's not just about the famous people i mean there's obviously people that are pretty well known it's yeah. just getting interest there's lots of people in this industry you know that are interesting to talk to yeah. and you're you're one of them and i'm sure you're i do wish your book the very very best of luck i'm sure uh, i'm sure it'll it'll sell by the bucket load and for one can't wait to get it ah, well uh, you yeah. have to but hopefully not too <laughs> <laughs> and listen paul thank you very much again and uh, take care yeah, thanks to you, okay See you thanks now bye-bye bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.